All right, good evening. It is 5.30, and at this time, we'd like to start the Teaching, Learning, Equity, and Pupil Services Committee meeting by calling us to order. Um, Board Member Schneider, would you mind providing a roll call uh, for attendance for us this evening, please? Okay. Uh, Tia Johnson. Present. Megan Miller. Present. Greg Schneider is present. All are present. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. All right, at this time, uh, that moves us to item 1C, the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda for this evening? So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion by board member Johnson and a second by board member Schneider. So I should probably write that down. Give me one second. We are doing things different today. All right, any discussion? Hearing none, all of those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Motion passes unanimously. Jump back to our agenda. All right. Next is the approval of the minutes. Would anybody like to make a motion to approve the minutes from our March 19th meeting? So moved. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all of those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Motion passes unanimously. We have uh, two items under information and discussion this evening. The first is a 4K program update. And at this time, I'd like to invite um, our executive director of teaching, learning, equity, um, Teresa Moratek, uh, to introduce this item. Thanks. Good evening. Um, thank you. Uh, tonight we will be presenting a 4K program update. Um, we adopted a new program this year. Um, the year previous to that, we did a pilot and we adopted Frog Street. Um, so we have Rochelle Elliott here this evening, our Director of Early Childhood and Professional Learning. Um, and then we also have a 4K teacher from Gaston, um, Jessica Watkins, that will be doing the presentation just to give us an update on how our 4K classrooms are doing um, with the implementation of the Frog Street uh, program. Um, so looking forward and thankful to, uh, to both of them uh, for taking the time this evening to present to the, the committee. Um, and I just want to, before we move into that, um, draw you to the theory of action. And Rochelle uh, will speak a little more on this. But in our um, teaching and learning and equity department, each one of the different directors based on their work streams have logic models and theories of action um, in what we're implementing um, over the next uh, three to five years that are in alignment to the strategic plan. And so um, that next slide in the presentation will highlight those priority areas in the strategic plan uh, because we're always aligning our work with that. Um, and so when we chose to go with this adoption last year um, and implement it this year, that came from a board decision that was in alignment to our strategic plan. Um, so just catching up some people as our board changes over and our audience changes over at times, just want to bring people up to speed about the context in which we're working in. Um, so um, Rochelle will uh, lead us off with Ms. Watkins. And again, thank you for being here this evening. Thank you, Teresa. So when we're taking a look at our theory of action about 4K, we're really making sure that if we create really safe learning environments where students can explore the different content areas through hands-on learning by using high quality instructional materials that are linked to state standards, that making sure that those materials and standards are developmentally appropriate using high academic language provides an opportunity to families engage in those lessons. And if we do this, teachers will feel confident with their strong pedagogical and early learning practices, and we can create a system for all 4K students to accelerate with their learning. 
when we're taking a look at the strategic plan, by having an all-day 4K program, we are addressing the inequities that are out in, those early, in our early childhood programs around the state. Not everybody has an all-day 4K program. Um, most places have a half-day program, and there are some that do not offer 4K. Um, but each year, you have more and more schools that are offering a full-day program. Our current freshmen are the first group of students that benefited from all day 4K. We're really looking at the whole child when it comes to literacy, math, oral language, science and social studies, and social emotional learning. Everything is encompassed in our uh, Frog Street materials. And also we're looking at engagement. How are our students engaged, especially through hands-on materials? And part of our um, uh, program is um, how are we engaging families. Through our funding, we have to do 87.5 hours of family engagement, and we get an extra 10% funding from DPI. So how are we engaging families? And the materials that we have have a special family engagement component. I'm going to hand things off to Jessica Watkins, who is a 4K teacher at Gaston, to really talk about our program highlights. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Jess Watkins. I teach 4K at Gaston. I um, have been in the district for 18 years, and I taught those uh, freshmen full day 4K. That's when my first year I, I came on as 4K. Um, prior to that, I was early childhood special education, and then kind of a combination of both. Um, so one of the, the highlights is that we do have an inclusive environment with opportunities for special education services right in our classrooms. Um, we, uh, in my classroom, I have occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language, and the early childhood teacher that come in and work with the students who need support. Um, like Rochelle said, we have full day programming with a full time paraeducator, and that really is helpful and supportive to <clears throat> maintaining our um, high, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> to maintaining our rigorous high quality instruction. That paraeducator is crucial in um, helping with small group time and learning centers and practice centers, and even when we're doing large group instruction, keeping those students engaged. Um, <clears throat> our programming is available in all elementary schools in our district. Um, we provide opportunities for um, art, music, social, emotional embedded right into our day. We also have plenty of time for outdoor and indoor gross motor play. Um, <clears throat> And everything is done through fun, engaging, hands-on experiences in this curriculum. This curriculum was new for me this year. I did not pilot it, and it's really been a nice change to what we had before. Um, and I would say it's a nice change for the staff and the students. They're excited about learning again. There's um, textbooks that are high interest. There's thematic units that are high interest. And it really keeps the engagement of the students. So we'll drive. Okay. A little bit, and I apologize. I work with four-year-olds, so I caught the spring cold. Uh, we um, so we start our day with breakfast. Breakfast is offered to all students. Breakfast, lunch, and an afternoon snack. Um, at that time, we really work on self-help skills, adaptive opening items, using language to request help. Uh, and then we go into what's called our Brain Smart Start, which is our social emotional learning, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, during our literacy block, it's a combination of large group, small group, and independent learning, and that's the same for math. So in large group, we might do a read aloud, work on some new vocabulary, do our, every day we have a morning message, and then um, we transition into small groups. Small group is teacher-led or para-led. We reinforce vocabulary. We work on some of the phonemic and <clears throat> skills. We have um, we work on letters and names and all of those literacy things that 
build a foundation for kindergarten. And then students, when they're not in small group, are in what we call practice centers. And practice centers are activities that we've already introduced. So it might be matching letters. It could be using whiteboards to write your name. It, uh, <clears throat> and the para helps monitor those centers. And then math is very similar. We start out in a large group to do some counting activities, introduce um, like a question of the day, and then we move on to a small group that's teacher-led and practice centers where students are doing things around the room. For example, this week we're doing reptiles, and so um, one of the centers we have is the students are using pattern blocks to make pattern snakes. Um, <clears throat> we, in the afternoon, have a short rest snack and recess again, and then we end our day with um, some STEAM activities before we do a closing circle and go home. Frog Street offers nine thematic units, and we've paced those out over <clears throat> the school year, so about one a month. Um, these units really are about the environment that they're in. So like students can relate to these units. It's not something that's abstract and far away. However, it's still teaching like high, <clears throat> high rich vocabulary. We're learning about the word skyscrapers and catapult and, and things that you, that you um, typically wouldn't think that a four year old, you know, might, um, might learn, but they're really embracing it. And you hear those words as they're playing and building and doing things. Um, so for example, on the move, it's not just vehicles on the move, it's your body on the move, it's how things move um, in the environment. And we are now on theme eight, which is animals. We just learned a lot about mammals and this week we're on reptiles. My students can tell you that mammals are warm blooded, that they breathe air, and they're, they're very interested um, this, this week that reptiles lay eggs. And so we, they would like to watch like egg hatching. That, that is the, the current um, <clears throat> high interest activity. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pass it over to Rochelle for his act 20. The ultimate question, how is act 20 come into this? Um, so we have a couple of pieces with the Act 20. We um, are still using um, the Hegarty Phonemic Awareness to really, in its additional program, to really strengthen our phonemic awareness for students, introducing sounds, introducing rhyming, introducing all of those um, phonemic awareness skills in a very structured and um, systematic way. So the teacher is up kind of doing some of those and the kids are following along. Um, if they can able to you know, give the two words back, carrot, carrot, that's great. We just keep introducing, introducing those different sounds for students. Frog Street is also really strong with the morning message, making sure it's bringing in concept of print, uh, alphabet knowledge, rhyming, syllabication. So then it's kind of the Hegarty and the morning message are reinforcing each other. Um, according to Act 20, we'll need to give um, a phonemic awareness, a letter sound assessment that will be assigned by the state. Um, and so I think right now we've had a little bit of changes. I think that will probably come in the middle of the, or the end of the year. I anticipate that it's going to be after next year, probably a beginning and an end. Um, also part of Act 20 that we, um, there are personal reading plans. It's not sure right now if 4K has to be included in those personal reading plans, but really when we're taking a look at our phonemic awareness and phonics, this is really building our universal for all students. So we will embrace whatever the state decides, um, what those personal reading plans look like, but if we were to implement that, I, if I make a logical um, guess, it's going to be making sure during those center times that Jessica talked about that we're bringing in small groups Groups and having like groups um, working on those skills. As we go to the next one, the literacy so scope and sequence is all throughout 
um, the different thematic units that Jessica has talked about. And we have some sample materials like what are the letter builder set looks like, the photo cards to pull out students' oral language, the different strategy cards for students. Um, and then you can see a photo of um, a teacher doing a morning message with the space frog. Space frog comes in to work on that concept of print. And so as we're writing, we're putting that, that space frog into there. I'm going to talk a little bit about math. Um, the math is a really good spiraling program, especially for our students. We come back to concepts that throughout the year that um, maybe they just weren't quite ready to learn. And also, these concepts go right into our practice centers, and so they're able to practice them daily in our classroom. Um, we do numbers and operations, shapes, colors, measurement. Um, measurement is a favorite unit measuring different um, water in containers is definitely one of the um, most popular practice centers in our classroom, uh, for sure. Um, and math standards are directly correlated with WEMOLs. And um, so those Wisconsin model early learning standards are currently in the process of being updated. And that's where we um, develop our district 4K early learning standards. And so as those are updated, we too will update those. But um, I, I have no concern that they're just going to continue to align right with our Frog Street math curriculum. Frog Street has an assessment system that has uh, literacy, math, science, social studies, probably more assessments than the 4K teachers would like. Um, or and probably too much data. So we're really focusing in on what are the assessments that we need to have, especially for literacy and math. And we can do those um, three times a year. So there's a beginning of the year, a middle of the year, and the end of the year. And you can see some sample data. I've got them um, for the top one is concept of print. There, there was the, con the um, data at the middle of the year, and the first one is the beginning. I probably should have flipped those around a little bit so we can see how students are progressing against the end of the year benchmarks. And then the bottom one is the rote counting. So buildings can see their own specific data and um, see how their students are doing. And then we can also look at it uh, as a district on where um, that data is, is falling through, or, or not falling through, is kind of shaking out. We will also, let me go back, Act uh, 20, will have some foundational reading skills that'll be outside of the Frog Street, uh, but we will still continue to do the Frog Street for the letters and the, the phonemic awareness and the sounds. Right. Frog Street comes with its own um, embedded social emotional <clears throat> learning curriculum. Um, there's a, a book that that um, correlates called Conscious Discipline, and we're working um, through that book and talking about doing like a book study. Right now, we're really focusing on that brain smart start every day. So similar to people who are familiar with morning meeting, we do something like Unite, which is like a song or a dance, um, and then Connect, which is a greeting around the classroom. Students know each other's names. They greet each other. Um, calm. There are different um, calming techniques, and then these are reinforced also in the quiet space in our classroom. So star breathing, balloon breathing, and then each unit comes with a new breathing technique, which they're always excited to learn. So this week, it's a snake breath. Um, and we refer back to those as needed throughout the day, as we know that um, four-year-olds are still learning to regulate their emotions. It's nice to have those strategies to go back to. And then every day, students commit to um, keeping our classroom safe with walking feet and helping hands and using a big voice. And they really take ownership of those commitments. Um, they have a little, you know, popsicle stick that they they put in a like a commitment box, and you can um, bring that popsicle stick when you're traveling to lunch or or wherever, and just kind of remind them that we're going to be safe in the hallway and and we're going to um, use our walking feet. And it's really um, been a a nice change in our in our social emotional learning. Um, and an updated um, that really fits the needs of the students in our district. 
Also, along with that, we have um, family engagement. And so, like Rochelle said, we have that 87.5 hours. And each week, Frog Street provides a newsletter that we send home digitally and a paper copy that includes some um, SEL learning, math, literacy, um, a link to our story and an activity that families can do at home with their student. And the last piece is I wanted to include what we do for summer school for 4K. So we have um, some materials through CKELA. It's all about me learning about themselves and their senses. Um, they've got some math where they start working on zero to three and just really getting accustomed to what is, what is school? What is that gonna look like when we start? And in 4K, sometimes those little ones are three when they start summer school. So just really getting them ready for what does school look like and it's we start with the all about me piece of that. Thank you so much. Any questions for Jessica or myself about our 4K program? Well, first, I just want to thank you. Thank you so much for showing up, even with your spring sniffles. I know <laughs> those classroom things. Um, that was a really wonderful presentation. Uh, Board Member Johnson, do you have any questions, thoughts, or feedback? Um, I, yeah, I have a question for you, and then I ha also have a question for Mrs. Moritek. Um, so on slide two, um, in your theory of action, it says if we, and you've got four bullet points, and we, another bullet point, and so on. So your first four bullet points, do you have those? Are those, um, do, you, do, you, do you have the ability to create a safe learning environment for students to explore, so on and so forth? Do, do, you, you're, do you have all of these bullet points so that the last bullet point can be achieved? We are continuing, they are all in, in the curriculum. We are continuing to provide professional learning for our teachers as we go through. We understand that we may have some students or some teachers that might need more support in those areas. And those are things that we are dedicated to do through professional learning and through uh, PLCs. Okay. And then um, the question for Mrs. Mortek. Um, they had mentioned that the freshman class is the first class to have the um, opportunity to be um, 4K students. Does the district have follow data on the students who have had 4K um, all day versus those that do not? Um, I'm going to have to defer to Rochelle. She might be more knowledgeable about that, the history of that. Right now, I don't have that information. I certainly can look into it and get back to you about that. Um, but it isn't something that I'm looking at on a regular basis. But it's an, it's an interesting ask. Um, did you have anything to add to that, Rochelle? Sure. So when I started with the 4K program, trying to pull who went to 4K and who didn't, and uh, because we have a lot of mobility of students, it was really hard to pull exactly who got a full day uh, looking at attendance, who was always there, who wasn't, who came in later in the year. So we don't have as clear data about that. Um, which is what I really was looking for to show like, yes, the 4K uh, program has truly made a difference. But we do know that students who are introduced to school and concepts at an earlier age do have that, that, that exposure, which is why uh, districts are bringing on 4K programs, especially full day. Yeah, I would just add to that. We know, we know what um, early literacy can do for outcomes on a more broader basis. So when we're pressing on early literacy and early grades, even down to right zero to three, and what that looks like, it improves academic outcomes overall. Um, and the other thing I would add is, you know, when you when you speak, we're still we're still living in our systems, the years of COVID, and so where sometimes it feels like COVID went away because we've sort of moved on with our lives, our children's, the unfinished teaching and learning that happened in those 
in those years are still being felt in the system, and they will be for a long time. And national research shows it even disproportionately affected high poverty school districts across the country even more with learning loss. And so when you talk to our teachers in our system here, they sometimes feel the difference with some of the students where they just didn't have the early childhood years. They were at home, and they weren't in schools learning executive function, learning how to do school, social emotional learning, those early literacy things like they do in, in an in-person environment. And so that's another piece of that that I think validates the importance of 4K programming in an all-day sense. Thank you so much for those questions. Um, Board Member Schneider, any feedback, thoughts, or questions? Well, the one question that I had before was kind of answered, and that's how does Frog Street deal with students who aren't developmentally ready to learn skills at a certain time? Um, but I noticed that, Rochelle, you said that you, you circle back to those skills throughout the year uh, to catch up those who are now ready to learn that. Um, uh, so I, I, I assume that those, are, those skills are being tracked throughout time to make sure that students then do achieve them later in the year if they don't when they're first introduced. Four, um, 4K skills are all throughout the year. Really, it's it's different um, than where we unique um, than other grade levels. You don't just move on, right? If the student doesn't have colors, you keep teaching colors until they have colors. Um, and the curriculum really allows us to scaffold for that. So while <clears throat> some student might be working on um, a pattern snake, for example, that has, you know, ABC pattern, some student might just really be working on, you know, sorting things between red and green. And, and that is where we um, are thankful that our special education staff can also come in and co-teach with us if they need additional support and have been identified as that. Otherwise, we do, um, like the district does, offer um, intervention to our students um, through the student support team process. We follow the same protocol and um, document those, that tiered support. The learning centers are really great for differentiating for students in math and literacy. So they can kind of pull those students back with them after they've gotten that universal instruction. Thank you so much, Board Member Schneider. Great question. Um, no questions. I guess I just wanted to thank you so much for coming and um, having, so I've had three kids all go through the 4K program, and actually my youngest was able to go through the pilot year last year with Frog Street, and um, anecdotally, I was we were, we were working on calming our bodies down, and I recommended some breathing, and I was corrected, because I gave her the wrong breathing strategy, and she taught me snake breathing, actually. So. Uh, Good, good times. So no, thank you so much for that presentation and for everything you're doing for our youngest learners. All right, uh, Dr. Garrison, did you have anything you wanted to jump in with? I'm I sorry. did. Thank you so much. You know, one of the things that I try to do is also remind people that you know, 4K is, it's a very important program naturally for not just any, for all communities, from the historically marginalized communities to the uh, communities that are, are are more affluent. One of the things I can say about the 4K program itself is that. No matter where the kid comes to us, naturally we have to, you know, service the student, and we—that's a year, that's an ongoing opportunity. Even when they walk into um, the, our summer school program, and then of course into kindergarten, and so we uh, realize that there are opportunities for us to to look at our 4K program differently. But we also want to stay in the game, meaning that the districts around us um, do have 4K programs. And the 4K programs that they have are opportunities for not only our school district to to recognize, but for our community members to actually, you know, possibly even partake in that. And we want them to come to, of course, our 4K program because that also helps us with our enrollment numbers. And so there, although there are some opportunities for growth, I just want to make sure that we realize that, again, we want to be in the game of 4K opportunities here in the school district. We not only do we want to be in the game, but we also want to make sure that our program is the um, utmost and stellar program for all of our families um, to, to partake in, if they have a 4 k -er, that's what I like to call it. Um, as we continue to work on um, our opportunities in this conversation, it is very important that all of our families know that, again, 
as they, you know, zero to three is important learning opportunities as well. And, you know, sometimes that, um, that's not taken lightly, you know, for school districts. We know that zero to three oftentimes is, is a, those are opportunities that we are not with the kids, you know. And so uh, we do rely heavily on our parents to, to help us in that space. Um, but re whether they are able to or not, we open our doors to them um, for K. And so, again, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Garrison. Uh, the last agenda item for information or discussion this evening is the continuous systems improvement. And at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Beavers, our Executive Director of Pupil Services. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Melissa Beavers. I'm the Executive Director of Pupil Services. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, I'm here with Eric Weir. He's the Director of Special Education and Student Services. We are here today to share with you how we've really leveraged our federal identifications and our continuous systems improvement work to shift equity mindsets in the school district of Beloit to ensure um, access for all students. So we've been um, working really hard since probably 2021. Um, and just recently, we've really been recognized for the work that we're doing regionally. And we've been able to present to our director, our regional directors. Um, we've presented at the state level. Eric has presented in California and the work. And we've had some national recognition. So we're excited to share the work with you. I'm going to pass it off to Eric, and then I'll circle back around. OK. Uh, so we're really focusing our work here on two primary um, areas of identification. So the monitoring systems that we're working off of is the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, uh, which is site-based or building level specific um, identifications, and then IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is district-wide um, identifications. So under IDEA, there's two primary um, areas that you can get identifications in. There's LEA determinations, which is based in two areas, so 50% compliance, 50% results. Compliance is like timely evaluations, timely and accurate data, record keeping, et cetera, and results is really talking about percent of students with IEPs meeting proficiency in ELA and mathematics, as well as timely graduation, and the percent of time that our students with disabilities spend with their non-disabled peers in general ed environments. And then there's also IDEA racial disproportionality, which is racial dispro in identifications or our discipline practices. And that really teases out students with disabilities in specific racial subgroups. Um, <clears throat> So like kind of mentioned, the compliance indicators focus on that racial disproportionality in special ed. We're looking at um, referrals for special education, transitions between birth to three programs, post high school transition planning for students with IEPs. Um, and then the results indicators are uh, graduation rates, dropout rates, math and ELA proficiency, assessment participation, um, and then the educational environments. So racial uh, dispro really looks at students with disabilities disaggregated by race in the area of discipline, special ed services, and disability categories. So it can be how we apply discipline practices, maybe disproportionality or disproportionately to students with uh, IEPs in certain racial subgroups, or it can also be that we're disproportionately referring students in certain subgroups for um, special education holistically or within a specific discipline category, such as emotional behavioral disabilities. When it comes to the ESSA um, identifications, <clears throat> these are part of the Title I process, um, and they are kind of supported, even though it's a federal guideline, the state of Wisconsin has developed uh, a metrics. And uh, what they're working towards is to cut achievement gaps in half, cut graduation gaps in half, and improve English language proficiencies by 18%, all within a six-year time frame. So DPI uses those indicators and identifies schools that need help. Uh, they put them into three primary categories. So at the lowest level would be targeted support and improvement. At the uh, medium level would be additional targeted support and improvement. And at the highest um, level of need would be comprehensive support and improvement. So this just kind of gives you, I know it's hard to see when it's projected uh, up there. It's a little small. But in those three categories, you can see when it's TSI or ATSI, 
uh, a building can get that identification for a specific subgroup. So it could be any one of our racial subgroups as well as students with disabilities. When it comes to a building being identified as CSI, that is a holistic identification. So that means no longer is it just one particular subgroup, it's overall the entire population in that building that is performing um, in the bottom 5% of schools receiving Title I Part A funds or um, has less than or equal to a 67% graduation rate. So those are the two areas that CSI looks at. So in the 23-24 school year, our district, uh, so this current school year, our district does have an IDEA LEA determination. Um, and we are happy to be able to announce that we're 100% compliant, meaning in those that 50% of that category, we got the highest marks you can get. Uh, results, on the other hand, we have some work to do. Um, and then um, I, the SS site-based identifications, six out of our 10 schools did have site-based identifications uh, through ESSA. 24, 25, we're still waiting. So those official results will be released sometime this month. Um, they don't have an exact date. They just say April, 2024. Um, however, we do anticipate still having the IDEA LEA um, determination. However, we also anticipate some uh, celebrations in terms of growth from the work that we've been doing. The preliminary data suggests that we have seen some improvement in some of those uh, results categories. Um, and we anticipate ESSA remaining the same for our buildings, um, and we wait to find out about the racial dispro uh, piece. Really though, it takes three to five years for any district that has identifications to be able to meet exit criteria. So this is not something that a district could be identified one year and then miraculously find themselves out of that identification the next. Um, and if that did happen, there'd be probably some suggestion around what may have happened with the data um, because it, it takes time. And those exit criteria are based off of a three to five year plan development. So what are we expected to do? Well, we have to create a plan, which we've been working on with support from uh, the technical assistance network. And that plan has to focus on modifying practices, policies, and providing professional uh, development to address the issues. Uh, so we have our, we have a district continuous improvement and then the buildings obviously have to build their building level improvement plans and the ones that have the S identifications have to make that link to that identification in that plan as well. We have to implement and progress monitor on those plans, uh, which again is not just a one year process, it's a multi-year process in doing that. And then for ESSA specifically, the uh, federal government has specific exit criteria and the buildings have to meet exit criteria one and two, and then exit criteria three, which is being able to ensure sustainability long-term so that they don't find themselves back on an identification. So Missy's gonna kind of cover our journey in a little more uh, detail so that we can kind of outline exactly what we've been doing here in the district. Okay, so um, how did we get to where we, where we are today? Um, we were um, paying attention to our identifications and so initially we started to work with the Wisconsin Center for Resilient Schools to really look at that DISPRO identification. And as we were working through that, we realized this is much greater than just MLSS and this one little identification. So we started working with the RTI and PBIS Center and created a cross-departmental team and started pulling teaching and learning in and some principals and some staff members in to help us with that work. Then that transitioned into a full technical assistance support from CESA to connect all of our federal identifications because really we've got these different identifications, but your plan should really be braided and be one plan so that we're not all working in silos. Um, so what we spent a lot of time doing with um, our, our core group, but also with all of the different staff groups that we've worked with, is working with the equity mindset cards put out by DPI and really focusing in on institutional responsibility, on changing systems and practices, and not focusing on changing the student or the parent or the teacher. We really have to look at our systems. So we spend a lot of time on this card, and these next two slides are just the front and back of that card, and we have groups read through it in a small group and just really pick out what resonates with you the most and kind of talk through that card um, and why it's so important to um, really learn and understand about institutional responsibility. 
<clears throat> so the first um, step we did was we did a needs assessment and we did a massive data review of many different um, types of data um, in order to create a systems impact statement, which is here. I'm not going to read it for you, but it really focuses on, um, it's really a student outcome priority statement and that really grounded us in our work. You can read that there. Our next step was to create a hypothesis of practice. Um, and we just started hypothesizing why, why are we at where we are at? And then we, we started to categorize all of our hypotheses into um, six very broad categories. And then we did an influencer activity. And on the next slide, you'll see what that is. But to really um, narrow down our root causes, and we got it down to three. So this is what an influencer activity looks like. Um, and those were our six broad categories, and we were just trying to draw what relates to what to really narrow it down. And this took us probably six hours, maybe, of work, just this one activity. And so you'll see our um, three root causes here, um, institutional beliefs about student groups and their families um, regarding student behavior, punishment, compliance, and control, instructional practices, policies, um, materials, and service delivery models, and current systems and structures that create a lack of coherence and consistent implementation. So you can take a look at those there. After um, we identified root causes um, from the influencer activity, we um, then created a theory of action. Um, and we were very careful. Um, we were doing this kind of at the same time we were working through creation of a strategic plan. So we were very intentional about making sure we were speaking the same language. So that was our next step was to create um, a theory of of action, and the first step in our theory of action was to recognize, disrupt, and address mindsets and beliefs in the school district. Because our end goal really was to create a system that we um, that we can provide the conditions needed for all students to meet um, le grade level learning um, and behavior expectations. So um, we wanted to create. Um, I'm sorry, we wanted to really look at mindsets. So we started working with um, inclusive practices and mindsets at the beginning of this school year when we were working with professional learning. Um, and specifically mindsets as they, as they relate to, like I said, inclusive practices. We offered professional learning for all staff groups, um, part of which included surveys to really establish a baseline of where are people at with their inclusive mindsets. And then that baseline was used to develop questions for smaller focus groups. So um, after that, we started um, conducting focus groups at all levels. We did administrative focus groups, we did staff focus groups, and we did student focus groups, grades two through 12. Um, we took all of that data that we collected and we used an empathy mapping tool and we, we started to identify themes through um, the information that we gathered. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, that's been, we're in year two of our work and our next steps are really looking to create a district vision of inclusion for all students. Not from the lens of special education, but the lens of all students. So we're thinking about our advanced learners, we're thinking about our EL population, we're thinking about our special education students, and really um, working to, like Eric said, that three to five years to get off those um, federal identifications. We're continuing to do the work with our graduation rate improvement team, um, really looking at graduation rates. Um, the early learning technical assistance is really looking at how we're providing program to those early early learners and like Eric mentioned, um, where are they accessing it, their instruction? What educational environment are they um, receiving instruction in? So we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but like Eric said, our, um, our early indicators are showing that we are going to see um, some positive results of that uh, as a result of the work that we've already started. So we're excited and um, we're happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you so much for the presentation and congratulations on all of your recognition. Um, Board Member Johnson, do you have thoughts, questions, or feedback? I do. On the eighth slide. Okay. Um, what is slide eight? Uh, the ESS 
a measurements um, under CSI. Uh, lowest performance overall performance score in the bottom 5% of schools receiving Title I. The bottom 5%, is that state or national? It's, it's state. Okay. Yeah. On slide 18, I'm sorry, I've got the wrong slide. Is it this? In one of the slides you um, was referenced penalty or rewards. And I was wondering what kind of penalties or rewards you were referring to. Mm. If you could no. just give me an example. Is it, I'm wondering if it's this when we talk about institutional beliefs about student behavior, punishment, compliance, and control. That part. Identification um, slot. Where we made the gains, but then the other two sections we weren't. Was that that slot? I'm not quiet. I know it's hard to answer without. I'm sorry, which slide number were you looking at, Dr. Garrison? The slide where we um, were identified, so we made the gains in identific well, correcting our errors on our um, IEPs, of course, but then the other two areas where we need to make changes. So what slide number is that? Um, I don't have the number, I'm sorry. Right. Numbers, I'm not. It's the Beloit's identification slide. That's the title of the slide, Beloit's identifications. Let's see. Nine. Slide nine. If you include the title slide. <laughs> <laughs> if you include the title slide, slide nine. Oh, okay, so oh, anyway, I'll sure. see if I can find it when Greg's asking his questions. Okay. Um, so. Yep, that's it. I'll let Greg ask his questions and look for the rewards and penalties. Okay, thank you. Oh, is that, um, oh, go ahead. I guess my comments are more that I r really appreciate all the time that goes into um, all of the work to do this and go through this process. Um, um, without going through all of the effort and the work to go through this, we're not going to keep moving ourselves forward. So I greatly appreciate the time and the effort um, and for everyone, everyone's involvement in this process. Yeah, it's been a great collaborative opportunity between teaching and learning and our department. They've been at the table with us the entire way, even though it started you know, from special education identifications. Uh, we really have been able to embrace it between both departments every step of the way, so. Thank you so much, Board Member Schneider. Did you have anything else? No, nope, that was it. All right, Thank perfect, you. thanks. Um, Board Member Johnson? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I realized I had corrected my own writing, <laughs> handwriting. It's slide 14 under um, institutional responsibility, changing systems and sample practices, the third bullet point, using penalties and rewards to gain compliance undermines intri intrinsic motivation working against real change. Find real motivators. What, what, what kind of it's rewards and penalties were you talking about there? So this, uh, this slide and the slide before it are not our 
um, slide. So the state of Wisconsin has created what they call equity mindset cards. Uh, and it's just a set of tools to allow teams as they're doing continuous improvement work to ground themselves in equity practices. And this is one of their their tools. So we've just taken it and used it as a discussion protocol. Um, and like Missy mentioned, we really just had teams kind of read it silently, reflect on it, think about it, pull out some key uh, points that resonate with them. And then we just really grounded our conversation in how we need to come together to change the system and not say that it's our students or our families or our staff or any one particular person or group of people that isn't maybe stepping up to the plate. So I, I don't know that I can really answer that specific question because we didn't develop and, and uh, publish these particular slides. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you so much, Board Member Johnson, and thank you. Um, Dr. Garrison, before I comment. Actually, um, you know, first of all, I want to say thank you to the team. I know that we have, you know, of course, work to do in, in, in this area. Of course, we've been identified naturally, so that's work to, mm -hmm. to, be, to be done. Um, getting off the list in one area is an accomplishment, and so I want to thank, you know, the team for, you know, working to make sure that we are off the list for that accomplishment. And I don't want to, you know, prolong the conversation, but the work that we have to do in these other two areas, um, again, it's going to take some time. Um, it's not it's not going to be able to be captured right overnight. It's not going to be able to be captured in a month or two. Um, that's why the state gives us the time to, to, to do it and to do the right work. And so I know that we are on that track to doing the right work. Um, and as we, you know, of course, clear some months in this conversation and possibly even clear some years in this conversation, we will see the gains that we need to see in the other two identified areas um, that we want to show those improvements in. Because no district wants to be on any list of saying that they want improvement. And that's why, of course, I'm bringing this conversation to the, the committee to make sure that we're all aware that we are working towards this and we want to see these opportunities be better for not just the school district board, but for our students and families that participate in this program um, um, throughout school, really, because it's a K-12 mindset and getting off that list. So again, thank you to the team and we look forward to continuous improvement. Thank you so much, Dr. Garrison. Uh, again, thank you so much. I did have a, I had a couple questions, if that's okay. Let me just pull up my notes again. I've got like 12 different screens up here. Okay, so to the, um, to the discussion about restorative practices. Um, I know a lot of people, I think there's a lot of different ideas about what that means and what that looks like. And, you know, I work in a building right now that has a team developing what our restorative practices, you know, system is going to be, um, you know, because you know, we're all in different places in different districts, right? And so it's a hot conversation. So can you help, um, like, so people who aren't familiar with what that is and what that means, can you help us kind of like paint a picture and like, what is a restorative practices like student discipline situation look like? So like, for example, if I am having a rotten day and I like, you know, punch Greg Schneider in the face or something, right? Which I would never do because I adore Greg. But, um, you know, if that were to happen and I get, you know, a suspension because that's our code of conduct or whatever it is, can you talk me through like how like, restorative practices in our mindsets work helps me not to repeat offend? Yes, but hopefully we've done the restorative practices work to build community mm -hmm. so we're not doing something like that because that's where we want to spend most of our time is building community so oh, that um, we're not harming because the, the point of restorative practices is to repair harm. Um, and so in a situation such as that, you'd obviously have to have both parties agreeing to come to the table and repair the harm. And that's essentially what, what restorative practices is grounded in. Um, and so um, having an honest and open conversation in a safe space about what actually happened and how that made you feel um, and then how you're gonna respond perhaps next time to, um, so, so you're not in that same situation. So like I said, you're repairing that relationship. Um, do you have anything to add? I would just add that it's not, um, it's not in lieu of a consequence. So mm -hmm. there's going to be a, a natural consequence. Every time we make a decision to do something, there's a consequence. Sometimes there are positive consequences. Sometimes it's negative consequences. But that consequence is still going to be there. The intent behind the practice is to keep us from finding ourselves in those situations again in the 
near future. So, you know, recognizing what may have happened, what may have been that trigger uh, for you in that moment to respond the way that you did. Um, like Macy said, repair that relationship with the person that that interaction may have occurred with or people that it may have occurred with. Um, but then ultimately uh, to help you recognize so the next time you have other alternatives, more positive alternatives to dealing with the situation than maybe the way that it was handled the first time around. Perfect. And I really appreciate that explanation. I mean, that's very much in line with like, you know, what I tell my coworkers who haven't maybe experienced that before, but I just know that, you know, we all as a parent, like we send our kids to school and, you know, we're hoping for like a safe and positive learning environment. And of course there are, there are concerns because people work as messy and students bring and teachers bring, like we bring a lot with us into schools. And so I just want to commend you and appreciate so much like the, the proactive and preventative culture work that we're doing. And it is so important to harmonize like you said, between people services and teaching and learning. And I'm so impressed with all the reports that we're seeing and just anecdotally what I've heard. Um, and, I, and thank you for taking the time to sort of like help paint that picture because I agree. I think it's it gets lost in the discussion that of like absolutely the code of conduct does not evaporate away. And it's, it's a foundation for the work that we're doing, like to set, maintain, and, and continue to implement those expectations and those consequences when things unfortunately do happen. So I really appreciate the work that you've done around this. Um, did anybody else have any other thoughts or questions before we start to close out? Brian, are you good? Good, awesome. Awesome, well, thank you so much thank for that you. report. And thank you so much for all of your time and dedication to this very important topic. I just gotta switch back to my agenda now. Because, oh my goodness, I have too many things up. Hang on a second here. All right, I believe what's next, because I seem to have lost my agenda here. Oh, there it goes. Is our next meeting date? Nope, I lost it again, sorry. Oh, there it is. So, jumping back here, our next meeting date. There it goes. Is Tuesday, um, it's May 21st, right? 20. Oh, we're going to change it. Just kidding. Our next uh, meeting date is going to be Tuesday. You said May 7th. All right, it's, it's posted as the 21st. So those of you who are playing along at home, it'll be May 7th at 5.30. And is there anything else before we adjourn? Oh, no, no, nope. Just I lied. Just kidding. Right. It was. It was right. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. So Tuesday, it was. My screen was taking a long time to load. So sorry, I didn't have that off the bat. Okay. Anyway, so Tuesday, May twenty first, twenty twenty four, will be our next teaching, learning, equity, and pupil services meeting. Thanks, everybody. Anything before we adjourn? Awesome. All in favor of adjourning our committee meeting at six twenty seven p.m. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much. No, you're fine. I gotcha. All good. Hey, Greg. Yep, I'm here. Are, are you cool taking minutes? So, like, I took minutes for this committee yep. meeting. You got it? All right, cool. Thank you, because apparently yep, I can't I do things at the same time. But you're good with us adjourning. <laughs> I forgot to ask for a motion. So after the mic was off, I just asked Tia, like, are you good making that motion? And then I just, all right. Yep. So I just put that in our minutes. All right, thanks. Okay, yep.
All right, if uh, board members could come on back so we can get started here. Okay, I'm going to call to order the April 16th, 2024 Human Resource Committee meeting at 6.34 p.m. Uh, Mrs. Dooley, could you have a roll call, please? Yes, you may. Tia Johnson. Present. Amy Levy. Here. Megan Miller. Present. Brian Nichols. Here. Greg Snyder. Present. Brian Anderson. Brian's going to be late and, and remote when he gets there, but he's he's going to be a little bit late. Thank you. Sean Levy. Present. Okay, the role reflects that Brian Anderson is uh, not present and uh, he will be joining us later. Okay, is there a motion for the approval of the agenda? So, so moved. Second. So I have a motion by Amy Levy, a second by Megan Miller. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. A motion for the approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. It's been moved by. Amy Levy, seconded by Megan Miller. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 A motion passes unanimously. We're now on to item 2A. A motion may be made to convene the Human Resources Committee into closed session pursuant to section 19.85, parentheses 1, parentheses C of the Wisconsin State Statutes relative to considering employment recommendation exhibits. Is there a motion or a need? All right, so since I'm not hearing anybody express a need to go into closed session, I'm gonna move us forward. And we are uh, to D, we haven't, we didn't go into closed session, but are there any open uh, session questions for exhibit a. Okay. All right. Is there a motion uh, for Exhibit A? So moved to approve Exhibit A. Second. It's been moved by Amy Levy, seconded by Megan Miller. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I motion passes unanimously, and um, our next meeting will be Tuesday, May 7th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. 
Is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved by board member Nichols, second by board member Miller. Since we didn't go in, is there closed session minutes? Okay. No, yep. And we didn't go into, right. And because we didn't go into closed session, we can't approve the closed session minutes if there were some, but there's not. Yep. All right. So um, that was discussion. Uh, all those in favor of adjournment signify by saying aye. 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 No, I think we lost board member Levy. Aye. And so now we're unanimous. And we are adjourned at 6.38 p.m.
Okay, I'm going to call to order the August, no, August, April 16th, uh, 2024 regular board meeting at 7 p.m. Mrs. Dooley, can I have a roll call, please? I think yes, you may. Brian Anderson? Here. Tia Johnson? Present. Amy Leaving? Here. Megan Miller? Present. Brian Nichols? Here. Greg Schneider? Present. 
Sean Levy. Uh, present. The role reflects that all members are present. All right, the Board of Education would like to let our families and viewers know that our regular board meetings are being simultaneously translated with closed captioning. You can watch the Spanish interpreted meeting through the link found at the board website under the watch meetings tab with tonight's date. In order to accommodate this interpretation, we will be monitoring the pace of our meeting to allow time for the interpretation. And I'd like to remind our board members and others speaking to please speak one at a time. Thank you so much for your consideration and understanding. Is there a motion for the approval of the agenda? So moved with um, the amendment that I'd like to move item 5A after 2A since our presenter is already online. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved by board member Miller to approve the agenda. Uh, with the uh, changes that she listed, seconded by board member Amy Levy. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. I will lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now at, to public comment. Mrs. Uh, Christopa, do we have uh, public comment this evening? Yes, we have one, Connie Aquil, and she is joining us virtually. Okay, all right. Connie is also our student board rep, but I have to read our public comments section. Give me one minute. <clears throat> the Board of Education meetings are conducted for the purpose of carrying on the business of the schools. The board as a representative body of the school district of Beloit wishes to provide an avenue for any individual to express interest in and concern for the schools. Accordingly, the public is invited to attend any sessions of the board or any meetings of the board of the board committees. At every regular meeting of the board, time is set aside for the personal presentation of individual or group comments. Each person wishing to speak during this time shall complete a public comment card with their first and last name home address, including city and state if other than Wisconsin, the topic to be addressed, and whether you are speaking for or against this topic. The comment card shall be given to the board secretary for entering into a public record. Each person will be given up to three minutes to speak on their topic of interest or concern. Should the individual require translation assistance, a translator may be of the individual's choosing or one provided by the district. Public comments requiring translation will be given six minutes. The Board of Education asks that individuals complete the public comment card, give it to the board secretary and approach the microphone when called upon. And we have our norms for participation. Okay, can I start? One minute. Uh, norms for public comments during board meetings. Members of the public are welcome to attend all open meetings of the Board of Education. Individuals attending board meetings are expected to conduct themselves in a respectful and courteous manner that models appropriate behavior for our students. Individuals wishing to comment are expected to comply with the following norms in order to maintain a respectful and orderly meeting and to prevent discussion of confidential matters in a public forum. Comments should be directed to members of the Board of Education and not district employees, students, or other members of the public in attendance at the meeting. Signage, banners, or other material which impedes any person's view of the proceedings shall be relocated. Speech that is belligerent, disorderly, disruptive, repetitive, or which exceeds the allowable time permitted for each speaker is prohibited. Concerns or questions that entail the disclosure of identifying information regarding specific students are prohibited. 
response from the board, if any, will be limited to clarifying inaccurate information, seeking additional information from the speaker, or acknowledging that the speaker has been understood. The board will not debate with an individual, and the board may not take action on an item raised during public comment that is not on the meeting notice slash agenda. The chair will interrupt and rule an individual who violates any of these norms out of order. If ruled out of order by the chair, the individual's opportunity to address the board will immediately end and the microphone will be turned off. Thank you for your participation and courtesy. Okay, Connie, you can go ahead. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm just doing this because I'm not able to do my Zoom board report today. I'm not there. But hello everyone, I hope this message finds you well. I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the impressive achievements of our students amidst their busy schedules. First, I want to commend the remarkable performance of SpongeBob the Musical. The dedication and effort invent invested into this production were evident, and it was a pleasure to support our Purple Knights. Additionally, the Read Your Heart Out event featuring our, featuring our Nightingales provided a heartwarming opportunity for our youth to connect with the younger members of our community. Though I was unable to intend, attend in person, I heard wonderful feedback from my little cousin who is eager to join the Nightingales in Bullet Memorial when she's of age. I also want to extend congratulations to Dianara Azarate and Rosalia Polito for their outstand, outstanding achievements at the competition in Milwaukee for their art pieces. Furthermore, um, the mental health event that was held to help destigmatize mental health um, was a significant step, step that was needed to address the issues of mental health within our community, um, which is a cause that resonates deeply with many of us students. So I was really proud to see that a lot of people in our community attended that event, and I'm grateful for it. Um, I'm also proud to highlight another important initiative that was that's called We're Here, which is a peer-led counseling group led by Bullet Memorial Knights. Um, these students demonstrated ambition and courage by pitching their idea at American Family Field last year and shouting out for our Beloit youth who struggle the most with mental health. Um, as someone overseeing the operations of We're Here, I am particularly impressed by my group's dedication and initiative, regardless of the setbacks we have received as youth. Um, on a different note, there seems to be a shift in the student climate following um, the election. Some students express concerns about potential cuts to their favorite groups or programs, while others may not fully understand the implications of the referendum's outcome. It's crucial that we take these concerns seriously and consider them as we move forward. Additionally, it's worth noting that students are increasingly attentive to the decisions and the actions of our current board members. Um, it's essential that we engage more actively with them, demonstrating our commitment to addressing their needs and concerns rather than what seems to be bickering about smaller issues. They are ready to see action done instead of just thought of, and I hope this election that passed has opened eyes for those who thought our community was satisfied with the board's decision, current decisions, I'm sorry. I extend my gratitude to all those involved who tried their best to have our community vote in support of the referendum, and I encourage you all to continue supporting and listening to our students. I truly hope you all help gain us back the trust of our students and our communities. Um, this concludes my report. Thank you. Board Thanks. President Levy, I have a question for clarification. Um, could you please elaborate on um, the bickering? I'm, I'm not sure what you're referencing when you mentioned that in your report. Thank you. Okay. So what I'm referencing to is basically what I have seen on my behalf um, and then also what students have came to me with um, by bickering. I think what they mean the most is when there's a lot of conversation around a certain topic that's not as important. 
for example, something as clarifying a statement that doesn't really need to be clarified, um, but that's just based on the feedback that I have received. Oh, thank you so much for that context, because I never would have categorized that as bickering. So that's helpful. Thank you so much. I'm just lost in my electronic agenda, so I'm going to find this where we're at. <clears throat> All right, so that is the end of public comment. Thank you, Connie. Uh, 3A uh, reports to the board. Oh, thank you. We did move that. Uh, 5A. Uh, BMHS fire alarm systems updates. And I'll start us off. Thank you, um, um, board, for allowing us to move 5A up. Um, and one of the things that we discussed last week was the BMHS fire alarm system upgrades. Uh, did We did go back and try to get as many of those questions um, answered um, as possible. Um, of course, Mr. Bricko and his team, I want to say thank you for, of course, giving us that, um, that space to kind of get some of these questions answered. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bricko. Of course, we do have a fire alarm panel. Uh, most of the information you already know. Of course, you already know how much it costs from Johnson Controls as well. Um, again, there were some questions that we wanted to bring some clarity to, um, but I will allow that, that, that conversation to happen with under Mr. Bricko and Mr. Um, Chady's leadership. Thank you. Is this on? Good? All right. Thank you, Dr. Garrison. Um, before we get started, uh, at the request of the board, I had Jason Robeson service uh, representative with JCI present on the call here. Uh, Jason, if you just want to quickly introduce yourself there. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Jason Robson from Johnson Controls, and uh, I'm in attendance to answer any questions you may have about the existing proposal and anything about uh, the fire alarm in general. Glad to be here. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Jason. Uh, in, uh, in addition to Mr. Robeson joining us, <coughs> um, also at the request of the board, I was able to procure uh, an additional bid on the project for the total replacement of the high school. This came from a competitor out of Milwaukee, Martin Systems. Um, now, mind you, this is a very ballpark figure. The, with kind of a quick turnaround on this, um, certainly we were not able to have um, the team come on site to do a thorough walkthrough of our space to really assess all of our systems in their entirety. Um, but based off of last year's annual inspection report, which was done by Johnson Controls, uh, this, this other party was able to crunch some numbers and give us some sort of budgetary projections on what it would cost to, to have a replacement of the system in totality. Um, I'll share that number here. So again, this is Martin Systems. Estimated projection for a total cost replace or total replacement of our existing system would be uh, 581,759. Again, very ballpark figure. That said, with the proposal that we have before us with Johnson Controls and understanding what the budgetary constraints are with um, with our district now, uh, it further leads me to believe that we're better poised and in a position to um, upgrade the simplex panel on our timeline, on our schedule, um, to position the district to bring about uh, the rest of the upgrades and updates to bring us up to code eventually on our timeline and on our budget schedule. So um, that said, I'll open it up to questions, either of myself or if anybody has uh, specific questions of, of Jason. Thank you. Um, my first question is, what portion of the quote is designated for allowance cost? Uh, for allowance cost, this, the quote, are you talking about the quote for Martin Systems or for? Uh, no, I haven't Johnson. seen a quote for Martin Systems. I'm talking about Johnson Control. Okay, um, I'm gonna defer that question to uh, Mr. Robson. Uh, yes, and I believe you, are you specifically talking about the special note section of the proposal? I am. Okay. Yeah, so 
basically that was that is a part of the proposal and again that's all built into the margin i don't know if i could give you an exact number uh, but but basically that troubleshooting is uh the dollars or part of the, the margin is included for that, for any issues that may come about in regards to the upgrade as it pertains to any existing wiring conditions that happen prior to, you know, the replacement. So basically what this is, is, you know, we can, we can support our components, we can support our pieces, but an electrician ran those wires behind the wall 30 years ago there's been, you know, other infrastructure pieces that have come and gone. So we just put that in there um, to make sure that if there are any issues that we uncovered during this process, um, that we can work to get that completed within the budget of the proposal. So as far as an exact number for what that is, it, it is just built into the proposal itself. So are you saying you're not able to answer my question? Not with a specific number. Okay, because that's disappointing because this is one of the same questions that I had at our meeting last week. Um, my next question, what additional work is needed to build, to bring our fire system up to code? Because your quote, and I appreciate the honesty, um, clearly mm -hmm. states that the work that's outlined will not bring us up to code. That, that is correct. Um, so bringing the system up to code would include voice evac system, which would be replacing the existing notification devices from horn strobes to speaker strobes. And on the electrician part of that, that includes what, running another set of wires for the audio circuit, for the audio communication of those speakers. So that, that is what included. Now, with that being said, with my, as we did this proposal, with my discussion with the Lake Fire Department and their, uh, they use a third party plan approver uh, for the approvals and submittals. Um, <laughs> We are doing a service replacement of an obsolete panel. So that is what is allowing us to upgrade the head end and the initiation devices. Um, because basically from what I was told by that third party, it's, it's E-Plan, um, they said, we will consider this a repair basically under two conditions. It's a replacement of a simplex panel with a simplex panel and you're not adding any devices. So basically what this does is allows you to fix the current problems that you're having with your current, uh, with your current panel, get the devices on the initiation to side that need, needed to be swapped out on a one-for-one -one basis, adding none of those. That allows us to do that part of the project uh, with the understanding from Beloit Fire Department that the school district and the fire department and Johnson Controls We'll put together a timeline over, you know, the next five, 10 years to bring that system all the way up to code. Okay, so if I understood um, your most recent statement correctly, we are doing, or, or we are considering doing an upgrade on an obsolete system. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's yeah. correct. It's a, it's a service replacement of an obsolete panel. Okay, so this, this system that is obsolete, Mr. Bricko, you said that this part of the benefit of this is that it'll buy us time and let us stick to our own schedule. So we can do the upgrades that are listed that will not bring us up to code. Um, if I understood you correctly, the voice component is needed to bring us up to code. So two questions. One, can that voice component be added to this obsolete system? And if yes, how much would that cost? Um, so the first answer to your question is easy. Uh, that is yes, you are forward facing. Um, as far as the cost, you know, I, I would say probably an addition onto this system with the electrical work because the electrical component, the electrical component of this is the, is the biggest part of it. Uh, which is um, running that wire, an extra set of wires to the entire school. Um, so I guess if I had to put a, put a ballpark on it, we would probably be around where 
you know, right in the ballpark of, of where your current proposal that you have for a, a system upgrade, again, you know, changing costs over time. If we're looking five or 10 years down the road, obviously those things change. But roughly, um, yeah, I would say another, again, this is super dependent on the electrical cost, but probably another, you know, $200,000 potentially. Okay. But again, this is, this, so just to add, and I'm sorry. I didn't no, you're fine. Up. Go ahead. Um, so typically what happens is a lot of these, a lot of these things, uh, these total system upgrades are done through any remodels or expansions that happen through a school. That, that would be one of the things that would trigger um, the school to be brought up to code at one point. Um, and again, a, according to the, the discussions I had at ePlan would be to, you know, the other thing that would trigger that would be to swap out the, you know, the existing system with another manufacturer. Did you, I'm sorry, did you see just to, to swap out the system with another manufacturer? Was that the? Yeah, if, if you decided to do a rip and replace option. Okay, so in summary, I just wanna make sure that I, I, I covered everything. Um, you're not able to tell me how much is allocated for allowance cost. And just to remind the members of the board, the allowance cost pot, so to speak, would cover the things that are not included in the quote. So that would be, once they open the system up, any additional materials, all AHJ additional requirements, any existing devices that need to be placed during the functional test after the FACP upgrade, and any troubleshooting, repairing, or existing wiring, and any patchwork. So we have no idea how much those things would cost, but they would be added on to the minimum of $145,000. And to bring us up to code could cost us an additional $200,000. Um, I believe my last question is, um, and thank you for putting this in bold in the quote, it made it easy to find. Firewatch is not included. I have no idea what Firewatch is, but with respect to a fire alarm system, I feel like I definitely mm -hmm. want it. What is Firewatch, and and how are we impacted by that not being included? Yeah, so Firewatch basically is, and our intention is to um, do, you know, the project could, will take a couple days at least. And our intention is to get that system up and functional at the end of every day, whether we have to stay late or anything like that. In the event there is an unforeseen um, issue with the system that we can't get it brought up over, over the night, um, without a functioning fire system, the requirement is that the facility is monitored by someone on site um, in filling out a logbook. Basically just having... So again, that is not our intention that that happens, along with the wiring notices and things like that. You know, it is our intention. Everything's going to work. There isn't going to be issues. Um, you know, so that that's kind of the idea around that is there is there is monitoring by a person on site if the system is not able to be brought up. Thank you so much for clarifying that. And I'm assuming we would need multiple individuals to patrol the property if the fire alarm is not intact. And that brings up another question. Has our insurance carrier been notified? And of course, we perfect world, mm -hmm. they'll be able to bring the system up each night of the work. Right. But if that doesn't happen, I would assume we would need to alert our insurance carrier that this is a possibility and the, the ground would be manually patrolled. And do we have a plan for that? Because I'm assuming that is, well, and I don't have to assume, it says it's not included in the quote. Right, and, and currently, thank you, Board Member Levy. Um, so our HES staff are currently contracted. The PM shift ends at 11 PM. So I don't know, definitely, as far as square footage goes, how many staff? Uh, Jason, I don't know if you have any figures on that, but uh, the plan that would be in place would be after 11 p.m. when our HES staff are off the premises, if need be for the length of this project, we could, we could swap out facility staff um, to cover the grounds and patrol the, 
patrol the premises. That's basically all Firewatch is doing is somebody that's awake, alert in the building, making sure that there's no fires popping up. So that would be my plan in place. Thank you so much, Jason. This, this was super helpful. And I do have a couple other questions, but I think it's more towards our staff. And I don't want to hog the floor, okay. so I can just throw those out there. And if other colleagues have questions, um, feel free to answer them in what order makes sense for you. Um, the first is just a logistical question. The agenda states that the amount is budgeted through the facility services budget. And I thought we were told last week that this was an unbudgeted expense. Could you clarify that, please? Correct. This was unbudgeted when we originally forecasted for this year's um, budget. These problems that transpired over the you know, course of the last few months with the several alarms, and just to give some context to the situation, about 4 p.m. tonight, there was another fire alarm tripped at the high school that brought in the fire department. I was on site um, without doing too much investigative work. I don't know exactly what that was a result of. Um, however, that I can, I think, paints a little bit of a picture for your question, um, Board Member Levy, that it was not originally budgeted for this year, but um, once we uncovered what, you know, that there were issues, we, we have it in the budget right now to pay for the proposal um, from Johnson Controls. Oh, okay, I must have misunderstood last week because I thought this was an unbudgeted expense. That's great. Um, and then other just logistical question, um, Again, in board docs, the preferred date and the absolute date are both 4-9, um, which we have passed. So I'm, I'm just wondering what is the actual preferred date and what is the absolute date for this project, just so we're not working off of artificial deadlines. Uh, I, would, I would probably defer that question to... I can take that. Dr. So we, yeah, we would always try to work with the schedule of the high school naturally and of course also with the schedule of what's kind of happening in our school district. You know, the goal is to, you know, try to get this done as quickly as possible. We also know that, you know, we got kids and that's this process that we have to kind of work through as well. So I'm thinking more so, you know, the summertime could be an option uh, for us to kind of get in there. But we'll be working closely with our professionals if approved um, to, to schedule that, that time frame for us to get in there take care of the work and be able to, you know, keep school functioning and or keep the summer school, summertime, I should say, yeah. functioning appropriately. Thank you, Dr. Gerson. On that note, too, um, with regards to the scheduling, the high school's already, quote, off limits. The uh, Nexus summer project, school, right. the HVAC project, is wrapping up this summer as well. Uh, so there will not be students and staff present in the building. So again, this summer provides an opportune time for us to complete this work on top of uh, the HVAC upgrades as well. I think it's possible I wasn't clear. In board docs, there's a, prefer a preferred date and an absolute date. And it's my assumption, which I want to clarify, um, that that is, is with respect to when the board needs to take action. So my question is, one, both those dates are the same which is kind of a flag for me, and that date has already passed. So I just want to make sure that, the, that we're all operating off of accurate information so the board isn't experiencing potentially the pressure of artificial deadlines. Like, this needs to be decided a week ago. So well, I guess if we could just clarify um, what the administration means by a preferred date and an absolute date so that we can make sure that those make sense with respect to the decisions we need to make. Sure, I can touch the preferred date part, the absolute date I can turn over to my team. Naturally, when we had this on the schedule for last week, um, that would have been preferred, but there was questions, and so naturally we have to get those questions that the board um, proposed for us the best of our ability, of course, over this past week. As it pertains to actual, I'll turn it back over to the team as it pertains to what was the thoughts there. Yeah, so the preferred date and the absolute date were inputted um, originally for last week's meeting with the hope that we could advance the project through um, and receive board approval last week so that we could carry on. Uh, today's agenda item simply carried over or copied over last week's agenda item, so there were no changes to it. You know, what the preferred date, I, I interpret the preferred date as the date of the board or the committee action and the absolute date is kind of the same, may not be the accurate, 
but nobody's told me otherwise in the past year. So So here's my concern, and I mm-hmm. totally get the preferred date being the night you bring it because you, you want to present it and get a decision and move forward. That totally makes sense. But the absolute date is for me like the point of no return. Like we need to make a decision by June 1st or we are going to have a problem. Does that make sense? So to have the preferred date and the absolute date be the same is a little confusing. And to have both of those dates pass, and and, and we don't have to beat a dead horse. I just want those dates to make sense. And then my final question, um, how often does the false alarm occur at the high school? I know you said it happened today. And does not have to be, because exa- you don't know when it's going to happen. Right. But like on a monthly basis, is this something that happens once a month, 10 times a month? Um, just if you could give us an idea of how frequently this happens. And I get it's an inconvenience. And we are, I, I'll speak for myself, I'm not trying to quantify the inconvenience factor. And I'm also not trying to downplay that. I get that it's disruptive. But when we're looking at spending a minimum of $145,000 to fix a nuisance problem, because I'm very clear, this is not going to make us more safe. This is going to remedy a nuisance. If the nuisance is financially costing us 12000 30000 then for me, that doesn't make sense. So that, that's the information that I'm looking for. Like, how, how regularly does this happen? And what is the cost when a false alarm happens? Thank you. So I can comment on that. I would, in the last two months, there has been four alarms, two during the school day and two after hours. Um, I would disagree with your generalization of this being a nuisance problem. I think this, again, this positions the district very well to bring us up to cold code fully on our timeline. Um, I, I think like any piece of technology that's 30 plus years old and outdated, we upgrade. Um, so that's, What is the cost? So, so we're looking at, well, one, let me back up. Um, one, I disagree. I think a, cert, a, a system that's 30 years old, you don't pour good money into bad by, by upgrading an obsolete system, but that's just one person's opinion who happens to be a board member. I think you replace it. Now, back to my original question, it sounds like this happens about twice a month. And again, I don't want to downplay the inconvenience, right. but what is the cost associated with those false alarms? Outside of personnel costs, I'm, you know, I'm usually the one that's on site with the fire department after hours. Um, so I, there, there isn't an hourly rate of what we would be paying somebody that's, say, hourly overtime. Um, so definitively, I, I'd say that there, w- there would be no cost to have me, somebody you know, that lives a mile down the road, to come troubleshoot with the fire department and uh, look through the building to make sure we locate the right detector, reset the panel. So... So outside of inconvenience, there isn't uh, the, the financial cost is negligible, but we are being asked to spend a minimum because we don't know what these additional costs are, nor do we know what our allowance cost is, which I hope that we would. So to spend $145,000 at minimum to fix a problem that doesn't cost us anything, but is a nuisance. Board, um, I'll, I'll take that, that, that thought again. I think one of the things that we have to do is remember that we are, of course, working with a budget that, you know, does have some constraints, so overall, but it does have some constraints. This allows us to um, work with the fire department, work with our preferred um, panel adjuster, in this case, Johnson Controls, to get us to the next, the next point, which will be, of course, replacing some of the, I like to call it the other stuff that will come with this opportunity. Um, you know the term nuisance. Yeah, it, it, it is. It does provide some pause for me as well. Um, you know, naturally we want to be safe in the buildings for all of our students. Naturally, I know you want the same thing as well, um, board member Levy. Uh, with that being stated, this is this is where the board has to make a decision around. Of course, as a collective, you know, we we would love to spend seven hundred thousand dollars or more to get this rectify once we get a competitive three bids and all this kind of stuff. But unfortunately, this gives us the space to correct the problem. And then with our own timeline, of course, the fire chief, they approve this as well. Um, we'll be able to make the corrections as we, as we need. 
naturally, when you have a house, and I'm just going to put this out there as, a, as an example, naturally, when you have a house, I wish I could fix everything in my house right at the same time. Unfortunately, I know I can't. And so in this space, this is where um, the, the administration has presented its report. I think we have done our best that we could to, to answer uh, most of the questions that you have presented. And hopefully it gives the board um, enough information to, um, to move forward and or we come back to the table with a different question. And so um, that's just kind of where I am right now for my team. Jason, did you? Um, yeah, if I could, if I could just uh, make note of the point that you know this is a this is a thirty year old technology. It's it's a lot of it is the technology portion of it. Um, you know, like you said, it, it's it's the phrasing of a service replacement of an obsolete panel. That is that's what's buying you know the district the leeway to do some of this on their own schedule. So with with that saying, you know, I I wouldn't upgrade or throw good money after bad this is this is what we're doing to bring where all the head ends so the facp which is the head end that has the display on it kind of the brains of the operation and the two transponders those are all getting replaced vast majority of the initiation devices are also being replaced because of technology changes over the last 30 years. Again, this brings you up to being forward facing and does get you that newer computer system, newer head end, newer technology with newer uh, initiation devices with also giving you the flexibility to do this on, you know, a budget, a budgeted basis as opposed to you know, we have to we have to eat this whole project in one, you know, in one one year. No, oh, sorry, Jason. On that note, can you speak uh, quickly uh, for the board and and uh, about the MapNet initiation devices sun, sunsetting two years ago? Some of the equipment, the replacement parts that are just not accessible anymore. Yeah. Yeah, um, so basically it's um, our MapNet technology was what is in, it's the initiating circuit technology. That sunset about two years ago. Um, so now the devices that are we, we are replacing on site are the new technology, uh, the ID net compatible devices. So basically what we did when we came on site is we had a device that basically pinged the circuit and anything that responded back, we knew was compatible with this 4100ES system. And anything didn't, we knew was MapNet only technology that would have to be replaced on the initiation end. And on the detection devices throughout the building, what was the number on those that would be replaced under this proposal? Um, I believe, it, I wanna say it was the majority of them. So basically what that tells us is you know, there hasn't been a lot of changes in the school infrastructure over time because as we would do expansions or remodels or stuff like that, we would put in the newest technology. So what that tells me is, you know, there hasn't been a lot of changes, fixes, moves, remodels or anything like that in, in, in the school in, in some time. Um, my question is, uh, Mr. Bricko, you had the quote from Martin Systems uh, just shy of 600,000. So to my understanding, that was to completely replace everything and everything would be up to code. What is the same quote from Johnson Controls to replace everything? Thank you, uh, Board Member Johnson. I, I don't have that projection, but um, perhaps uh, Mr. Robson, do you have ballpark? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's tough. Unfortunately, that wasn't requested of us. Typically, again, people are not gonna, gonna do a project like this uh, on a total system upgrade unless they're required to through something like a, a remodel or an expansion to the building. Those are the, again, those are the types of things that would trigger this. Uh, knowing Knowing where the budget sits, we did everything we could in our power to keep us from having to eat the whole project in one year. So that was upgrading the existing, or excuse me, replacing the obsolete panel, 
and doing things like that again with the sole purpose of allowing you know the school district to be able to budget moving forward and do this in incremental steps instead of having to do it all at one time thank you and then my other question is i don't know a lot about fire systems <laughs> um, but i have a house that's almost a hundred years old so i know that some of our electrical outlets are out of code because I know what the city code is, but because they still work, I'm not changing them. Um, e eventually, when they s cease to work, you know, I will bring them up to code. Well, my husband will. But anyway, um, how, um, as a board member, when you hear that something's out of code, especially when children are involved, you know, it's and I'm a mom, so my, you know. I, that maternal <laughs> reaction kicks in, and, and I'm concerned about that. How bad is it that some components are not currently in code? So the only part of you, the only part of the system that wouldn't be up to current code, and again, you are grandfathered into, you know, existing code. That's why the fire department isn't making you do this, you know right now um so to um so i don't want out of code to scare anybody um you you have a functioning system that is monitored and has a notification system to get students out of students and personnel out of the building what we don't want to do this is all enough to be proactive because with the 30 year old system and the components being either not able to be procured or you're using used parts because there's nothing new available, which is what this system is currently going through. What we don't want is for a board that we can't replace or a power supply that is no longer available to go bad in this current panel. Then you guys are down without a system. And that is a big problem. You know, from the personnel standpoint, from the from the life safety standpoint, that that would be my con biggest concern if, if I was in your positions. And with the 30 year old system, you know, unfortunately everything has a lifespan. You know, it, if we just said, let's just push this out indefinitely, you will have a catastrophic failure. You know, again, not necessarily gonna happen next year or the year after it could happen in two weeks but this is an old dated 30 year old system that has dated technology and components that are no longer accessible or able to be procured. Thank you. Uh, Greg Schneider and then Brian Anderson, you'll be after Greg. This is a point where I hate to say that we've actually been fortunate that with the malfunctioning panel, what we're getting are alarms, um, saying there's a fire and there isn't. Since we already know the panel is failing, what would happen if when the panel fails, we don't get the fire codes coming through and there is a fire within the building? Um, so I, I think it's real clear that we need to do something and we probably need to do something fairly soon because this is, would be much more of a protection for all of the students is to make sure we have a system that will function reliably um, uh, you know, I understand it, to me, it makes sense instead of upgrading or replacing part of a system to do the whole thing, but with the budget, at least we can, the system we have, um, the parts that aren't being replaced will still continue to function and continue to work, um, and allow us to, uh, spread the cost out as best we can throughout the budget. Yes. Yes, this, this panel that we're pulling in, putting putting in, would have full forward functionality for voice evac and things like that. That is current code requirement. Yes, and repairable. All right, Brian Anderson, are you done, Greg? Brian Anderson. Thank okay, thank you. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a couple of hypotheticals here, Jason. So work with me here. Okay. Let's just assume the other quote we have is. Let's just call it 600,000 because I need easy math. Your quote is 150 to do this portion now. 
let's say, because now we can do it on our own time, we do the, I'll call it a patch upgrade, whatever you want to call it, get the, get the safe. And two years from now, we want to move now, we're prepared, we want to move to this next step of really replacing the system. Couple questions. Would that cost be, forget about what things cost more in two years. Mm -hmm. Would it be that additional 450000 and still be in line? Or would the money that we've spent, you know, this 150 be a sunk cost? And would our only option, because we've already spent 150000 be to work with you because of the proprietary panel you're putting in, even as there's this replacement? Yeah, no, this, this is the, uh, I'll call it the first step into getting you compliant. So does that make sense? So you're not, so what we're doing now, say two years from now, you want to go like, hey, we got money, we're going to go, we're going to bring it up to code. All that entails is, is changing the existing, um, running that extra wire circuit, like I said, the wiring for the audio circuit, because now on top of power, you also need audio. Um, swapping, swapping out those horn strobe devices to speaker strobe devices, and then you are a fully code compliant system. And, and is so that everything you do with ahead. somebody other than Johnson Controls? Say that again, I'm sorry? Would that be an option we'd have with, on an open bid process, or would it be limited to Johnson Controls because of the proprietary panel? Uh, no, to add the notification, that would be something with Johnson Controls. But with that being said, um, any company you've ever heard of, like a Siemens or a Honeywell, all have the same, um, you know, the same proprietary uh, lock on their program. Our technicians are trained by our company to work on our systems, and we don't want anyone getting into that programming, changing something, messing something up. Uh, you know, the alarm doesn't go off and the school burns down because of it. it it's, it's more for security reasons. And even with a third party, you know, uh, a company that distributes and their product through a third party, um, you know, it's not like there's in Milwaukee maybe for manufacturer XYZ, there may be one or two options. You know, they're not saturating the market with, you know, uh, you know, in, in Beloit, I've got five options for this third party system. And whoever puts in that, third party system is also going to put a lock on that programming for the same reasons that we do. Does so you're saying sense? if let's say hypothetically we say no we're going to go with this other company, we're going to spend mm -hmm. 500,000 you're saying you would not be able to service that. Correct. Yeah. Thank you very much. I I we could probably confirm that something's wrong, but if anything needed to be changing in the programming, we would not be able to do that. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Are there any other board members with questions? Can I just clarify what Brian, Brian, first of all, thank you for asking that question. Um, we asked last week and got a different response. So what we were told last week is that if we went with a new system, one of, one of the benefits of that would be that we would have vendor flexibility. But if I'm understanding Jason correctly, whatever vendor we choose to go with, all of the fire alarm systems are proprietary to that vendor, which is accurate. I would say the latter. Um, that, go ahead. What you just described, uh, board member Levy, the latter that you said, the, based on the proprietary ownership of each vendor, um, yeah, that, that would lock us into. So no option would give us vendor flexibility. This is a marriage, not dating. There, there are certain fire alarm products that are out there that provide for the flexibility. A good example would be this building here. This building has an Edwards system in. So Johnson mm -hmm. Controls could come and look at it probably, but they really don't have any desire to service it or fix it parts-wise because it's not their product. But other technology companies could service it. Okay, so I, yeah, I thought it was clear, but oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Jason. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just You're wanted okay. to clarify that... Um, yeah, we basically on any, you know, companies, people work with 
on service contracts outside of Johnson Controls. And basically all those people can do, or if we had a service contract on an EST panel. We're not able to work on it. We don't, you know, whoever put that in is going to lock down that programming. And, um, you know, you can't use a Johnson Controls smoke detector on an Edwards panel or vice versa for, you know, for any of that. Okay, this is probably me. So last week we were told that we would have vendor flexibility if we went with a new system. A few moments ago, we were told that each vendor has a proprietary system, so that flexibility that may seem attractive is not an option. And so the final answer, because then you start talking about the Edwards system here, and said that there is vendor flexibility with repair, not just diagnostics, but if something needs to be fixed. Do we go to one vendor or do we have vendor flexibility? And the reason I ask is because when you have vendor flexibility, theoretically that should drive down the cost. Yeah, and unfortunately I think the answer is gonna be it depends. You know, it, 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 if you're using a Simplex, if you're using a Siemens, if you're using a Honeywell, if you're using any of the brand name fire protection systems, you're pretty much proprietary locked into that distributor manufacturer. However, there are other systems that are out there that provide the flexibility that we're looking for, much like I believe the system that's here at Colac, um, which would provide us the opportunity to use any number of different vendors. You know, if, if we're not happy with service with one vendor, we can find another vendor that can provide the service, you know, that meets our expectations, meets our cost parameters, whichever. So is there a reason, and maybe it was, but was consideration given to having whatever system we have at CAC, because I'm sure it's up to code and it's working appropriately to have that at Beloit Memorial, because it sounds like that's gonna give us flexibility. Before you answer that, Board Member Levy, I'm, I'm thinking about just your last comment, that's why I'm kind of jumping here, because I know some of this is about like what we heard. I'm just doing this from my collective understanding also. So 30 years ago, when that Johnson control system was put in place, and those are based off of proprietary technology even then, that you're, you're locked into who you're working with. We're 30 years into the, we're at the end of life cycle on a product. It has exceeded that. It hasn't gone down before, but now it's at the place where some things are happening because it's 30 years old. And what we got brought to us was a choice by our administration, but their recommendation was work with Johnson Controls, spend the $145,000, we'll be up to code, and we'll be working. Well, not we won't be up to code, but right. the system will be functioning as it did, as if it had not stopped before. Still with a 30-year product, but it's working. Mm -hmm. So the, the restoration, um, so the recommendation that was brought is like, you know, when this thing started misfiring on codes, that's when we realized there's a problem. If it wasn't misfiring on codes, we'd just be like, hey, it's still working. So this repair is to make sure it's still working because one, Dr. Garrison, our administrator, who we hire to watch over the, the operation of our schools, his team has identified that we've got a fire protection system that is not working as it should. The recommendation that they brought to us is we need to spend 145, around $145,000 to make it work the way it should. The same way it was working before we knew we had a problem. So even though we talk about the cold part because we're in a, you know, 30 years later, codes change, but we're grandfathered in and everything was working well until it wasn't working. Where we put the, so that flexibility, um, I think this is a different part because what I understood last week when we brought the question of, well, do we have three bids for a repair? It's like, well, you work with Johnson Controls, you need to seek Johnson Controls to repair it because it's a Johnson Control system. And then the idea of, well, even though money's tight, if we spend 145 to fix it versus 581,000 to put a brand new one in for the next 30 years, we've got different choice points. And I think the flexibility part was, yeah, if we're gonna put a brand new one in, we don't have to use Johnson Controls. We could choose any other vendor. 
But if we're going to service what we already have, that's why we have the recommendation for Johnson Controls. So the flexibility in a vendor is not on the repair part, but it's on the if we were going to seek a brand new system. Yeah, I, I would say the considerations, board members, plural, levies. Um, you know, we've got 16 different facilities. They all use various fire alarm, so they're not all with one vendor or mm -hmm. one brand. Um, the real consideration was, could we afford to do this within this year's budget and get this project done this summer? And what, you know, the answer to that was yes, we could afford the $145,000, $150,000 out of Tommy's budget, uh, facilities budget this year. Yes, we've got access to the high school this year, you know, so we can hopefully get this taken care of this summer before students return. We knew full well that replacing the system in its entirety, even going with, I'll just call it an off-brand fire alarm panel, was gonna cost more. And, and we had fairly good certainty that the more was not gonna be affordable to the district to accomplish this year. And just to uh, piggyback off uh, Mr. Levy, your comments about what brought us here last week, and just to reiterate what Jason had mentioned too, these uh, initiation devices, um, that have sunset over the last years, I can't uh, emphasize that enough, that when we're faced with something that could be dire and we're unable to procure the parts and necessary resources to, re to repair our, our existing system, then, then we're in trouble. As I hear the fire sirens yeah, I was going outside. Say, as long as they keep going that way, right? <laughs> Not that way. It went over the bridge. It didn't go to the high school. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> Um, and I guess to make uh, just to, to make a clarifying point on on using EST as an example, you are still kind of pigeonholed into using authorized EST dealers. So you know it's not like you can call us, call everybody. It it would be siloed still into who are your authorized EST vendors. There might be one in your area. There might be three, but it you know it's it's not. You know, you don't have a Rolodex of different companies you can call to work on these things, regardless of what, you know, what manufacturer you're working with. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, number one, um, is the, uh, on the, on the quote that you have, you have, uh, detailed the design labor cad labor project construction management and technical labor is that all done by johnson employees correct okay but the electrical contractor is subcontracted correct okay would it be would it be um would it be possible to say that the electrical contractor probably works on other fire systems Besides shots and controls, um, I would say yeah, that's that's probably a, a safe assumption. I mean, outside of the actual components, uh -huh. it's it's really you know a couple strands of wires, okay. um, you know, but at least branching out from the panels full of stuff, right. but branching out for the devices, it's okay. you know it's it's usually a set of wires. Okay, thank you. Next question, Tom. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Were you finished, Jason? Uh, yeah, I was. I, I was just going to say that you know, the the true flexibility is with the electrician, right? Because they're all just they're they're running wire and they're hooking, okay. you know, they're they're landing on terminals and and, and things like that. So okay. yeah, that that is the one universal part to this whole thing would be the electrical work because there is no proprietary wiring or anything like that that is involved. Right. In it. Okay. Thank you, Jason. So next mm -hmm. question for Tommy and or Bob. Um, so I don't have the I don't have the facility study with me. So help me out here. The rest of our the rest of our buildings, except for this building, I would probably say Frozen, uh, maybe to some extent uh, Cunningham. I don't know. But how are the other systems at the other buildings? Do we know? Do we have a Do we have a feel for that at this point? 
Yeah, I'm not sure get, that I don't we, want to get too far into the weeds, but yeah, that comment made earlier made me think about the other buildings. Yeah, the facilities assessment looked more at structure, um, and I would say the major trades, the electrical, the plumbing, um, those types of things, and less so at specifics about fire alarm panels or elevators or things of that nature. You know, we could probably make a good point that they perhaps could have, should have looked at those. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know that it really specifically identified that uh, unless it did on the individual schools, and I don't believe it did. No, that wasn't uh, uncovered when we walked through with UA and Findorf. Um, just based off my time here, um, you know, I, I can just say definitively that the majority of our issues have transpired from the high school. Um, our elementary schools or middle schools, um, yeah, I just, and I'm no fire panel expert either. I leave that to Jason and his colleagues to answer these questions. But um, overall, I haven't gotten a sense from our other facilities that we have run into um, sort of the scope and scale of some of our other issues that we've seen at the high school. So, so no issues with any of the other fire systems in the other schools? Not to our knowledge, but we'll, let's also preface that right and say up until about, what, four months or so ago, we weren't aware of this you know, being an issue down the road either. Right. right. Okay. Thank you. Megan Miller. Hi. Hey, um, I think I, I feel really satisfied with what I've seen, and I also do appreciate the language that's included to sort of describe, although they don't provide a number, that a lot of the incidental costs are built into the estimate. So um, on that basis and in the interest of not um, creating learning disruptions and potential increased safety issues, uh, I guess I'd like to make a motion at this time, if that's okay. All right, so sorry, I have to close out the contract so I can see the correct language here. All right, so at this time, um, I would like to make a motion to recommend the approval of replacing the BMHS existing simplex fire alarm control panel to the upgraded simplex 4100 ES panel by Johnson Controls in the amount of $145,065.89. I would offer a friendly amendment before there's a second um, for the minimum amount because all of those things that are, unless we want this to come back, if it's under that 50,000 mark, um, if it's under the $50,000 mark, it doesn't need to come back to the board. But they have, Johnson Control did a beautiful job of laying out what is not included. And since we don't know what that allowance fee, this quote is a minimum. So for understanding, okay. What I would recommend is a minimum of the quote that's listed not to exceed, and I would bump that up $50,000 because that would keep us in line with policy about what needs to come back before the board with approval. So I'll just make the, so what's the difference between the recommendation and following the policy? Well, uh, board member Miller said the, the amount, so the amount that's recommended is $145,65.89. To be prudent, they haven't opened this 30-year system up, and they were very generous in outlining all of the things that are not included. It would be naive of us to think that there are not going to be additional cost above the quote. Now, policy states anything over $50,000 comes to the board for approval. So to not tie the hands of administration, so to speak, I think it would be prudent to have the motion read for a price range between the $145,065.89 up to $195,65.89, because that keeps us in line with policy and it covers the things that we are certain will increase this cost. Just a suggestion. Uh, as the person who made the motion, I have zero problem with that. All right, so there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. There's been a motion uh, by Megan Miller. Uh, whoever is recording, make sure you have it 
as it uh, was stated with the amendment that she accepted from Board Member Levy, and it's been seconded by Greg Schneider. Is there a discussion? Yes, and I'll be very brief. Um, I don't think it's wise to continue to pour money into what we have clearly been told is an obsolete system. I'm so glad to hear that the current quote was budgeted, which is different from what we heard, and that's wonderful. And I'm confident that the administration can find the remaining amount to replace the system, preferably with a vendor that gives us vendor flexibility, um, instead of locking us in with one vendor. And I would like a roll call vote, please. So I did is have there, Is there room to make a clarification on that statement or am, am I? No, on? actually we're in discussion. Out? There's a motion on the floor. So this is where board members okay. conduct discussion. You're Thank good. you. You're good, Jason. Thank you. Um, I think uh, for me, as we're discussing this item, you know, from last week to this week, it's clear for me like what needs to happen and, and where we're at. This is just for me. Uh, on last week, looking at $145,000 or not knowing X, what X is, how much it would cost to totally replace it. Because $145,000 is a lot of money for something that's, you know, you're just patching something for 30 years. Um, having the conversation and the additional time and having a different understanding is that one, like there's not multiple quotes because of the proprietary nature and our provider is Johnson Controls. That's why it's Johnson Controls and not multiples. Uh, other people with other quotes. Also being given a price of what a total replacement would be. Um, you know, we, of course we have budget constraints but we'd have to make that decision. Four people would have to say, we want a brand new fire panel now. I'm not hearing that. So as I understand, and we'll, and we'll take a vote, but as I understand it more from our administration's um, perspective, why was this their recommendation? As Mr. Bricko said that, you know, this will restore our system so that it has the functionality that it's supposed to have and it's giving us more time before we have to make other decisions. And those are one of, like, as we look at, you know, we have on other issues identified by our facility study, $23 million worth of end of year life that we already know of. This is just one thing that popped up over the last four months that we also need to deal with. So knowing that we already have $23 million of end of life things that hey, everything's fine until it's not fine. Um, and what this lower cost will do for us now versus completely replacing the system. And we have to balance that against other needs that we don't know yet. Um, and like that wasn't you know the plan. I am now more comfortable than I was last week um, with going with this approach um, because it, there's time, it, it does what it needs to do uh, because we as a board were made aware of a problem. We have our administration's proposed fix for the problem. We've discussed it and I kind of see it from the different angles of why not go brand new versus fix what you have. Um, and even in going brand new, understanding this industry and how things are working now a little bit more, we're still gonna be proprietary and locked into one space. You're not. We're not getting multiple people to work on it. So, I'm, I'm comfortable um, supporting it. And I know some people would think that, wow, you all spent an hour and ten minutes on this. Well, you know, when you're you're spending other people's money, it should take some time. Um, but I think that you know, and sometimes that's what it takes for people to come to an understanding of what their position is on something and why we should or should not do something. Uh, so are there other items of discussion? If not, we'll proceed to our vote. All right. We'll have a roll call vote. Ms. Dooley, are you uh, calling the vote for us? I am. I'm ready when you are. All right. Hearing no other discussion, yeah. Ms. Dooley, give us a roll call vote, please. Okay. Greg Schneider. Aye. Brian Nichols. Aye.
Megan Miller. Aye. Amy Levy. Nay. Tia Johnson. Aye. Bryant Anderson. Aye. And Sean Levy. Aye. Okay, and the vote passes six to one. All right, thank you. Let me see where we're at in our agenda because we moved this one up. All right, Jason, I think we're we're done. Thank you for your help this evening. Okay, so now we're on to 3A, uh, board president report. Thank you, everybody, for your time. All right, thank you, Jason. All right. So I just want to provide uh, some comments um, uh, this evening as I already close out here in my time as the board president. Um, when I ran for the board, one of the things I was concerned about uh, was our children. Uh, my prayer for the children of Beloit is the same that I pray for my own children, that they increase in wisdom, stature, and favor. Uh, the academics, the athletics, the activities, the arts, all those things that we do in school and that children rem rem that remind children of their experiences, those are things that help to make them wise. Um, particularly when concerned about their stature, uh, I came on as we were still um, dealing with COVID-19 and we had lots of decisions about when school would resume in person. And so uh, as what everyone was concerned at, a, at that time, not knowing what we know now or experiences, um, that very great concerns about the health of our children. What was it to be sick? What was it to be separated uh, as they were? And then also, um, I have two children, a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old. And I've watched many of the children in Beloit uh, as they participate in activities at the YMCA and other parts of our community and Walmart, uh, at church, and just all around the community. And I've watched these young people grow up uh, as my young people have grown up. And also as these students are doing great things in our community and we read about them in the newspaper, as their parents write about them on Facebook, and we are actually there in person to um, see them in some of the uh, great activities that they're participating in and those awards. So that stature, they're making a name for themselves and they're doing positive things and being known for positive things. And lastly, watching our children develop a heart of service that they'll work uh, to do good for other people and in turn have experienced in life that other people will work to do well for them. Um, that's what I think is important about the work that uh, we've done here in these three years. Uh, one of the things I had said, I was looking to provide vision and leadership. Um, and um, I'm thankful for the time that I was trusted uh, to do this work uh, for our district. Uh, at the time, uh, as when I came to the board, you know, we didn't have a strategic plan. And being a member of this community for a long time, um, different thoughts or opinions of what is the state of our district uh, have varied. And people even ask, why would you even want to waste your time doing that work? Um, but I do believe in the people that educate our children. I do believe in the people that are working on their behalf. I believe in the children on themselves because I am a kid from Beloit also. Um, one of the things I thought is important uh, is working with other board members. Uh, we did develop a strategic plan uh, there are financial decisions, there are um, educational decisions, many decisions that should have been made at different times, in my opinion, that had not been made. And establishing a strategic plan was the collective will of our current administration and the board to say, let's outline the things that we're trying to do. And we were successful in doing that. Uh, along the way, one of the things that happened is we had to hire a superintendent, and we had to evaluate a superintendent. Um, because with the many transitions that have happened with board members and uh, leadership, that it caused some inconsistency for us. And I think that 
that transition in leadership is what has caused some of the problems that we faced in the district. And also we would have board members, and this is a long time to serve three years. It's a long time. Uh, I'm a professional educator, so I'd like to bring, I'd, I'd like to think I brought a certain stamina to this work, but if I had not been a professional educator, I wholly understand why sometimes people have to tap out of this work because the personal persecution you face and just trying to make good decisions for, um, for kids and do what you think is right and fair, there's nothing wrong with criticism, but we do have a level of unhealthy criticism and critique in our community um, that has been a problem for people to get us to have a longer bench of community members willing to serve. So that was one of the things that we wanted to do as a board and we've worked together to address board development, um, to write collective commitments, to participate in the Wisconsin, annual, uh, Wisconsin Association of School Boards annual development tool to measure ourselves, to see that we're working together and that the dysfunction in our district is not because seven people could not work together with an administrator. Very important that as we made those transitions from superintendent um, to staff people serving in between to hiring an interim superintendent, and we even came to a place where people did not want us to hire uh, a permanent superintendent, but because we felt that we were gaining momentum and we had a strategic plan, the best thing to do was to begin to plan for tomorrow, and we hired a superintendent. One of the results of that has been some of the increases and gains that we've made over the year. Do understand that when you've got a lot of work to do and you're making incremental gains, uh, that's not a lot or it might not mean anything for some people, but even to struggle forward is progress. Incremental is different from standing still and it's definitely different from falling back. So I am proud that we were able um, to make that incremental progress because it's those little steps in progress that lead to bigger things. Um, just briefly looking at our strategic plan, I want to put the board in the mind of certain things. That our first goal being equity talks about the disproportionality uh, that we faced in our district. We have uh, many different racial groups. We have students that have uh, many different labels in terms of how they are as learners. Um, and when we look at what was in that continuous systems report during the teaching, learning, and equity um, uh, meeting, that CSI, ATSI, TSI identification, that describes how different students in our school are or are not experiencing the benefits of having an education. It's important as we wrote in the strategic plan that we have systems and structures or data to be able to explain to our community that yes, our children are at where they should be, they're above where they should be, or they're below where they should be. That that communication gets out to parents so parents know what to do when they're sitting at the kitchen table in their home with their child. Um, in our culture and leadership, we address having a place of belonging and trust in this district because trust had been broken with different leadership by different board members, and even by different entities in the community. And so we wanna change how we were perceived and how everyone felt, and that's something that when trust has been broken, it takes time to repair that. Um, one of the important parts of that, as we described, is when we welcome new members uh, to the board, uh, thankful to Tia and Tom for their service and their willingness to join, the same as uh, Mr. Nichols, the same as when Jawan came and uh, Brian came, and they said that they felt welcome because that is the type of space that we wanted to provide uh, for community members who are willing to serve their community, that they felt welcome uh, to this work because we need everyone in this work. We've got a short bench and our bench needs to be longer because there's more to be done. Addressing our leadership and staffing and that is having a superintendent, having someone who is consistent that our community can depend on to handle the work of the schools and for the employees themselves. 
uh, to build that institutionalism within a district to kind of understand how some things are going to be done and not always having something change. And then that collective efficacy, because I do believe that we can do more together. Uh, we're looking to provide that professional growth for all people that are involved in our system uh, so that you become a better educator, so that you have oversight, so that you have supervision that helps you do your job better and recognize the great job that you are doing. And that in the end, when I think of all the people that work in the school district of Beloit, no matter what role that you have, your job is to serve the greatest asset that we have in this community, and that is our young people. When we turn to our whole child um, goal in our strategic plan, um, I know that Beloit can educate uh, young people well because it's worked for me in 1995. And the things that I've gone on to do um, since 1995, when I left Beloit Memorial, Mississippi Valley State University, The Ohio State University, uh, Viterbo University, other universities along the way, uh, Virginia Union, Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology. It's because of things I learned in the school district of Beloit. I have an education, and I have the confidence that an education provides. My parents did not have the type of education that I have, but they worked hard and they trusted the school district to give me something so that I would be able to go out into the world and be a productive citizen and be able to raise a family. That is what we are trying to provide for the children in Beloit, to take their parents' desire that the school district work and provide an educational benefit, that they can have a dream that their child and them, when they sit down and talk about what their kid wants to be, that their children are equipped to do that. So when we look at the individual achievement of students, and parents know where their children are at. They understand, is your kid at where they should be, above or below? And they're working towards that because everyone individually sits in their own home. It matters how our school achieves overall, but most parents are really concerned with, how is my child doing? And that's the thing that we want to continue to focus on. And in those years from 1920, where there was no state report card from DPI, because of COVID, from 20 to 21, where we had one star at 46.9, to 21-22, where we were 48.7 with two stars, and even on last year, we were 22-23, where we were 50.6, and I call that two stars plus. We have shown increased achievement. And I only bring that up because the stars are not in the end, or one test, the be all, end all of what is happening with our schools. But that's the way our state is measuring us. And if you recognize that the people around us have a four and people around us have a three on the same instrument, when we are increasing, you have to say that we are increasing. What does 23-24 hold for us? What does 24-25 hold for us? You know, our goal by our strategic plan says that we want to meet expectations. So when we look at where we're at right now, we have a plan that we made in 2022. It's now 2024. And we're showing that we're trending toward our goal. So we're on track. And we will see what 23-24, 24-25 brings us. In a district like ours, you have to address issues of poverty, and so in our goal for the whole child, we talk about social-emotional learning, uh, social-emotional behaviors, uh, PBIS, culturally responsive teaching, restorative practices, because there's more than academics that are happening, and sometimes we have to set the conditions for learning, and those things have been addressed. And then in Beloit, when we talk about health and wellness, those arts, that music program that we have, the theater program, our athletes, the other activities uh, that our young people are involved in, those are the things that people come around and celebrate in our schools. And we want to create those opportunities. We want to have those opportunities for our children. One of the things I think that we have uh, probably needed to do, and I, I'll call on that for us to do more uh, going forward, is our engagement. And I think that one of the things you have to understand is that, like, in these first three years for me, 
because we're at so many critical systems not being in place and where they should be, we just kind of had our head down to kind of get some of the work done. And there's a lot of things to do. But in our engagement um, goal, it talks about creating student belonging. Mm -hmm. And I feel that when students proudly say that they're Purple Knights and they call out the year that they're graduating or what year they're in, that we're working on that. But I want young people to feel like they have what they need and they're confident going into their future. Our engagement plan talks about our communication with our families. And we have to understand the needs of our families and that we're helping them to understand where is your child? Is your child at, above, or below where they should be by a standard? And is their education meeting your goal? With our staff development, we're talking about life cycle commitment to the employee from recruitment to exit. There have been many calls as we handled our budget situation for why don't you fire this group of employees? Why don't you let that group of employees go? And it's just, it have to be based out the consideration to understand that we're one of the largest employers in the city of Beloit. How we do something matters. When we're doing some of the things that need to be done, are we creating more chaos and instability in the system? Those are decisions that we have to make. And I've been a former employee in the school district of Beloit. And many people have worked in Beloit and left. And sometimes people come back. But that life cycle commitment to, from the recruitment to the exit of an employee is one that really matters. That's sometimes why these HR reports are long, where we're, when we have certain things that are happening, because those are unique and particular things to Beloit in terms of how things have been handled in HR. And then lastly, our community partnerships, working together uh, for our students. When I consider the first uh, referendum that was put forward, and then the number of supporters that came on in this time, we see that those community partnerships are increasing. If you think about the work at our high school in um, our academies program uh, and our convening organization, uh, the Greater Beloit Economic Development Corporation, that community partnership is important. It's very important for a city to embrace its school district. And there are other entities other educational service providers, but there's only one school district that is the public school district. And for our city to grow, it involves that work with this school board and this district. And lastly, as we're addressing our finances, we know we've got concerns about the fund balance. That's why that conversation went on for about eight hours, for, for about an hour, <laughs> felt like eight hours. but. From starting at 7 to ending that conversation around 8:10 when we started those questions, it's not just about the fire panel. It's about the limited resources that we have and what things do we need to do so our children are safe and we can provide them an education. We've, along the way, we've had facility studies completed, which are some basic tools that we need to make decisions that were not in place. These are things that take about 18 months to complete. And now, as we go forward in the next three years, we have uh, tools in place to help us make decisions. Like I said, we have, at the end of this year, $23 million of capital needs, $23 million of things that, hey, it hasn't broken yet, but when it goes, it's going to be a problem. That if we were in a position to take care of these things before they come up, that's $23 million in this year things that are at end of life, $140 million over the next 10 years. So we've got some decisions to make. What I'm most proud of in this area is that we had a responsibility to make our community aware of what our financial position was. And when we started last November and uh, worked to get referendum on in uh, January, even though there was a no in April 2023, we put our community on notice that there is something that needs to be done here. Because this is bigger than the seven people that sit here. This board will be changing because I'll be stepping off, but the same problem is going to exist. 2024, there was a no. 
November 2024 is a possibility that, question mark, what will happen? As it was kind of described that, you know, we needed the money yesterday, we're asking for it today. If you say no today, we're probably going to have to ask you tomorrow. We are going to need our help from our community, and this is one of the other problems when you look at our state financing, that this is not just a Beloit problem. These are things that are happening across our state and across our country. And as we look at these decisions with our budget, 2021-22, a deficit budget, 22-23, a deficit budget, 23-24, a balanced budget. These are decisions that take place over time, and you often don't have all pieces at once. We're trying to do the things that we can control to give us the best outcome, to put us in the best position that we can be. Um, political winds blow a certain way, and you receive a benefit that you didn't think you'd receive, and some relief and some help. But it still comes back to the space that we've got to make certain decisions, and some of the things we're left with are to make um, What's the right thing to do and what's the right thing to do? Because sometimes the things we're choosing from, they're both right. But how are we going to do what needs to be done? So those are some of the things, just a, a quick outline for you, of things that we've dealt with over the last three years. Um, you know, I felt like if I win, I win. And if I lose, I'm going to win. Um, you all will be in my prayers uh, as you do the work that needs to be done for our children. And I will support you in that work from the community. Uh, welcome to uh, Tia, who's coming back. And welcome to Tom. Thank you for stepping up to do this work. And it's been my honor to serve uh, the school district of Beloit, our community, and our children. Thank you. So, Board President Levy, I'm going to take a, a quick point of personal privilege to thank you for sharing your brilliance, your professional expertise, your wisdom, and your compassion. I'm a better board member for having had the privilege of serving alongside you. Thank you for your service to our children, our staff, and the community connected with this district. Please know that you have made your wife, your children, and a significant portion of our community proud. So thank you, Board President Levy. I'm going to jump in. Don't pass them out very um, easy. <laughs> 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 hey, I did a good job. All of them, it was worth it. You did. I want to say something, too. So when I got to be elected Board President um, officially, because before I got to step in when somebody else departed, um, I immediately knew who I wanted our Vice President to be. And I cannot thank you enough for the support that you gave me for the very uh, the year that I was able to serve. It was a proud year for me. I'm going to look back at it when I'm retired and feel really good about it. And so much of your wisdom, guidance, and just, yeah, I'll echo brilliance and compassion as just an educator and as a person and just the deep sense of, of trust that you put in into me and have evoked in much of our community toward the benefit of our school district is just profound. And I, you know, I'm definitely a better, a better educator and a better board member because of your guidance and you'll continue to be a role models. Thank you so much. President Levy, I'll never forget the first time I heard you speak publicly and the first time I saw you, uh, it was, 2009-2010 at Merrill Elementary, you came and talked to the students and parents at an event there. And I remember thinking, wow, I need to meet that fellow. He cares about the students. He's, his heart is all about the people. His compassion, his caring, it, I, I remember, I remember it well. It's one of those memories I can play back in my mind exactly where we were in the gymnasium. And um, thank you for staying with the Bloit School District and your commitment to all of us. Well, Mr. Levy, um, I don't know if you recall, but uh, 
my wife and I met you uh, right after we moved here. We came to a couple of board meetings, and um, you were kind enough to come out and talk to us both times, and that made us feel welcome to the city of Beloit and, and to the school district. And at that time, I had no idea <laughs> or inkling of sitting here. So, um, but, um, you know, I, I appreciate your guidance for the, for the last year. And uh, you do have a commitment to the children. And you, you and, and Mrs. Levy have, are raising a couple of dun, dynamic young children. And you should be proud of that. Uh, above everything, of course, and um, I applaud you both for that. So, wish you nothing but the best, and uh, you know, I'll still wave by, wave when you go by, and you can stop, and we'll have a chat and uh, all that good stuff. But wish you not, nothing but the best as as you go forward. And thanks for thanks for your guidance. Bye, bye, bye. If I could say something, I'll say Board President Levy, and and then I'm going to end with that board president Levy part because that's just a portion of who you are. Um, I would say to Sean, uh, thanks for what you've done. Um, I think I think you've been an asset to this board um, for the two years that I've been on it and, and, and longer from, from what I hear um, before I was on it. But um, I, I have no doubt you're not done serving. You're going to serve in your own way going well. So again, thanks for what you've done and thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Sean, I, I agree with everything that's been said so far, and I echo your deep commitment to to not just the children of Beloit, but to Beloit as a whole. Uh, and I've really enjoyed our our parking lot conversations that have lasted a while after meetings, as we talked about a lot more than just the school, but your ministry and all things that you work on. Um, I'm greatly going to miss those times that we have together to do that. Uh, so thank you so much for all that you have done and congratulations. And, and I know you'll stay involved. Thank you, Sean. That was, that was it's called a eulogy. <laughs> it was awesome. Because most people don't get to hear the good words, so I do appreciate you uh, for those good words. Uh, again, uh, before I turn it over to the superintendent uh, for his report, I do want to say thank you again to the staff um, that serves our children, that have worked in the district, um, you know, and also to um, our former board members that have served uh, for our staff, you know, working in it organization is difficult or with the institution because the institution itself the building the desk the institution can't give you love the years that you put into a time and a place how short or how long the institution the building is not going to love you the way you want to be loved but it is the relationships it is serving with other people um that will give you that feeling of fulfillment, and even as my colleagues have done for me today, uh, of gratitude, not for the kind words that they had for me, but just that um, we have done something together. And so I, I would say to you that are working in the district, because I have also been an employee in the district, say, I don't know what this board is doing, why are they doing that? Uh, that now that I have been to this seat, there are many things that happen, and we only see pieces of it when you're not sitting here. And then there's other parts that once you come to this position, you actually see all the pieces and more. And there's even pieces that we don't see because we're not here on a daily basis. That's the role of our administrator. Uh, but to our community, uh, and like I said, to those former board members, it's that tornado siren, we'll figure that out. Um, but in general, we can all have disagreements, but what will help our community be positive 
and move forward together is what we would look for. So we're gonna go into recess now because it's superintendent report, but we're gonna respond to this tornado warning. All right. All right, thank you. Oh, I left the ring. All right. All right. So I actually go right here in the war room. Yeah. Yeah.
All right, Mrs. Dooley and Brian and Greg Schneider, we're back. Are you back? From our weather-related yes. um, recess. Just, yes, and hopefully everybody is safe. Yeah, um, we're, we're okay. Everybody's okay. All right. So I do see all board members on screen or here with me. All right. So we were resuming at 8.57. Uh, and... And I had just thanked everyone for those kind words. Um, <laughs> and when I said eulogy, I just meant when people when people speak well of you, because most times, in a, you know, you're not there to hear that type of thing. So thank you very much. All right. And uh, we are now at uh, 3C, uh, Superintendent Board Report. So let me just first start off by saying, you know, I want to make sure everyone is, you know, keenly aware that, you know, everything that comes into a boardroom is oftentimes, um, it's hard to determine what's going to happen. Um, when I was thinking about my thoughts in this moment, I was thinking like, okay, well, what do I say about Sean Levy's leadership since I've had the wonderful opportunity of serving with him? Um, there's some times when, again, when we walk into this boardroom, we have a plan and it don't work out the way we want it to work out. That's just <laughs> duly noted, right? <laughs> Greg, uh, there's some times, and, I, and again, I, and it's something that I, that, that I really want to share. Um, so there's some times that go the way exactly the way we want it to go, you know? Um, but I will say that when I sit down and I think about all the time that we've shared, Mr. Levy, um, this is what I'm talking about, um, talking about the things of our school district, I never not once felt like I was rushed talking to you. You listened. You were attentive to my conversation. You actually are one of the first people that I can honestly say in the school district of Beloit that I've had <laughs> hours we calculated probably days long conversation with <laughs> if we calculate our time together yep. and um i know that's that's i think it goes without stating that a board president has to map a school district with the superintendent he has to map a school district with the community he has to map the school district with staff he has to map the school district with so many parents and so many families and that work of a board president is not easy. It's not. And I would like to personally say thank you for taking this hard work that we call service and making it seem as if this is the love of your life, minus Mrs. Levy. You know? right. I'm serious about that. Seriously, yes. minus Mrs. I mean, I mean. I mean, I'm serious because that's that's how I felt. Like you never you never paused on any of the time that I called you at night, called you in the morning, 5:30, 6. I mean, we've had some long, dire conversations around the things of the school district of Beloit, and I want to personally say thank you for taking that time and again never making me feel like I had to rush to get something done. And that's hard. I'm telling you, that's hard. Because I came into Beloit with, with, with some high hopes, and I still have those hopes. But you allowed me to kind of process my thoughts, process how I needed to, to move, give me some guidance along the way. I'm serious. Um, but I never felt like, again, you, you rushed me. And that's, that's, that's an important space for me. You've already listed many things that you worked on, the strategic plan. You, oversee, you oversaw the outgoing and the hiring processes of not one superintendent, not two superintendents, not three superintendents, but actually four. I mean, because Mrs. Moore takes service as an intern, also I count that, okay? So that's four people in three years, <laughs> two years of your service that you help usher in 
And of course, um, that hiring process is a detailed process for a board president. And so I want to say thank you for at least bringing me here and allowing me to serve with the board. Um, you help navigate, you know, a positive collective commitments from this board as well. And I think that's a very important space to kind of pause with because when you're doing board work and when you're having conversations about what you want it to be, that's, that's something that I can say that was ushered in under your leadership. So no matter what no one thinks about this board or have any thoughts about this board, this was the board that actually said, let's try to get this, this conversation as a collective board commitments. Correct. That came up under your leadership. You helped balance our budget. You were part of that conversation. And I, again, I know I came here with, you know, high hopes again, trying to get everything, you know, taken care of. And you helped me see how we could actually make that happen, along with my team, which I want to say, thank, of course, thank you for working with Sean as well. Um, man, you're a true Purple Knight. <laughs> I know a lot of people talk about it, but you know where I'm from, you got to be about it too, right? And Sean Levy is a true Purple Knight. So I got a, I got a little something I want to give you. <laughs> so I got a couple of candy here, of course. <laughs> Says, thinking beyond now, school district, <laughs> Beloy want to present you with this nice, um, Candy jar. <laughs> that's just, just that's my joking part right there. Y'all supposed to laugh, but <laughs> clearly, clearly it was a dad joke, and it just went right over my. <laughs> dun dun dun. That that kind of felt. He's he's a he's a school district parent. You know that's that's important. You know his 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 his, his students or his 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 not children. Sorry, his children go to our school district. I think that's important to know. Sean came in as a unicorn. I'd like to say that as well. He came in as a vice president. Most times people come in as a board member, okay, as a sitting member. Sean came in as a vice president. In his next two years, he served as the president. That's, that's, that, I ain't gonna say that rarely happens. I'm gonna say that it never happens. But for me, that was my first time hearing that, okay? And so again, I think your skill set that you brought to the board was very important. And I don't want to rush this part because I feel like I need to say this about you and for the whole community here. You have, you have helped negotiate very tough conversations. We had a, a unfortunate death in this community last year, okay? And I don't think people realize the magnitude of work that that comes with, especially from a superintendent's perspective. Sean Levy helped us navigate that conversation. We had some very serious race conversations that needed to happen, that, that did need to happen in the school district, I should say, that did happen in the school district. We had the, the, uh, uh, the Proud Boys or an uh, organization that, that made some very serious threats to our, to our community and to our staff members. You were here to help navigate those conversations. We had to shut our school district down Sean Levy was the board president during that time. And that's an important space. Again, you helped navigate that, that space. I wasn't here. You helped navigate that. And I think the community, you know, should recognize the, your, your sacrifices and the things that you have done um, for, this, for, this, for this school district. Now, I know we have not passed two referendums. But I can tell you, since I walked in this door, I've been trying my hardest, but I, I, feel, I feel as if I always had a partner to bounce some of my hard conversations off at nighttime when we leave in, our, leave in this space, you know? Because, you know, it's, 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 it's like I said, every time we come into the boardroom, it may not go the way we want it to go. You know, it may not go exactly the way we want it to go. But again, you've always provided that space for that. You know, you've also ushered us out of COVID Okay, because Megan Miller was the, well, was the president at that time. But you helped usher us out of COVID, which is also a very tough space. Anybody who's been a superintendent in the state of Wisconsin knows that going into COVID was one thing. Coming out was absolutely hard. And for a historically marginalized space, whether you, whether you are historically marginalized as a school district or you're part of the gifted and talented conversation, that was still a hard space. Sean Levy was the board president for that. 
And so I wanted to just take that time and really just lay out some of the things that I think you helped navigate um, for the school district of Beloit. But most importantly, I just want to say thank you. As a school district administrator, you've been, in essence, not in essence, you were my first board president. I've worked with a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> I have. But you were my first board president. And that means an absolute lot to me. And everyone knows that I can, I have an oratory, I can, you know, I can talk on, I can go on and on with the best of them. Maybe not Sean Levy, that's a joke. <laughs> Maybe not Sean Levy. Um, but I want to say again, you know, uh, thank you so much. Sean comes in here with two real heavy book bags. Oh, actually, he comes in here with a real big book bag on his shoulders, okay? And I'm telling you, every time I see him, <laughs> every time I see him, I'm like, man, I'm not sure how you can walk with that book bag. It's so heavy, it's so big, right? But then I start thinking about the work that you do. And so you're used to carrying so much for your family, for the community, for the school district. You're used to carrying so much. And that is, that to me shows who Sean Levy really is. He carries it. He carries it. He carries it with, with, with pride in the positive way. He carries it as if this is what he's supposed to be doing. Those things you can't just make up. Now I hope as you, you know, transition from off the board, you find a rollaway <laughs> to make that <laughs> to make that a little bit lighter for you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need one now. But again, I want to say thank you. We do have a plaque that we have for Mr. Levy. Um, this is a little more um, special. Um, I'm opening it up. Your gift. Hopefully, everything's spelled right. Sean A. Levy, President. You know, we're good. Um, it's just a gift showing um, that, you know, showing that your presidency here. And I just want to say again, thank you. We also have some um, other goodies. Everyone loves our tumblers that everyone talks about. <laughs> but we also have some other things that we wanted to share with you. And again, I wanted to take this very quick four minutes um, to, to share the, the, those things about Mr. Levy. Um, Thank you, Dr. <laughs> again, I couldn't have done it, you know, over these two years um, without somebody who would really want to listen. And I appreciate that. You've made me a better superintendent. I can tell you that. Okay, I can say that to you personally. You've made me a better superintendent. Okay, seriously, you made me a better superintendent. And hopefully, you know, you feel the same way about being a board president. I made you a better one as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. I didn't uh, even talk about this stuff. <laughs> I mean, to, to say this. Yeah, yeah, so I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Garrison. Uh, really, just to say, you know, to Mrs. Moritek also and to Dr. Garrison, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that um, I have said this before, that as a board president, as a board member, when you don't have to worry about what is happening in your schools, because there's 5,200 kids, about, about 800 employees, that's about 6,000 people, 6,000 human beings doing what human beings do and sometimes what they should not do. And uh, Mrs. Mortek, as she served us, and Dr. Garrison made it easy to worry about all the things that we could see as board members because we knew that they were taking care of all the other things that come up in the day-to-day -day work. And for us as board members, there's the things that, even when we look at our email, there's the things that pop up. And one of the things to think about in this work and for our community are all the things that are not happening all the fires that are not burning because there are people that are taking care of that work for us and, and serving. So I do want to say thank you for that mm -hmm. because that is um, a major relief mm -hmm. to anybody who sits on this seat to know that things are being done well. And I do appreciate that things were done well. And that concludes my, um, my four minute report, five minute report at this point. But I also wanted to make sure that the board realizes that you all were gracious in being able to serve with, with, with Sean Levy as well. I think that's an important space because a lot of times people come on the board and they don't want to work together, but you all have shown that you could work together and that's because of Sean Levy's leadership of requiring us really to kind of, you know, continue to work together. And so again, thank you to the rest of the board for working with 
um, um, Sean Levy as well. So one last clap for Mr. Levy. This is his last, this is his last board meeting um, as our president. Um, and he deserves, he deserves that. And so I'll turn it back over to you for the rest of the agenda. Um, take another privilege here just to say thank you to all the board members that have served. Um, sometimes, I've been said I'm long-winded. <laughs> So uh, just one, when you work with people very closely, you have to learn how to work together and let people be themselves. And I do want to thank uh, those board, board members that have served with me uh, that allowed me to be myself and allowed me to be comfortable and those that challenged me to make me be better. Um, and for the collective sense that people approach to work with together so that we could do things for Beloit. I really do appreciate that. For a committee reports, what does it say, Megan? What's the next one? Uh, business operations and business operations and finance. So we have not met since our last meeting, so we'll meet again on Tuesday, May 7th at 5.30. Please join us. Teaching, Learning, Equity, and Pupil Services Committee. It is 912, so I'm going to waive my report, but it was a fantastic meeting, and you guys should all watch on YouTube. Thanks. Okay. Uh, the Governance Committee, there will not be a Governance Committee meeting. There will be a reorganization meeting that will be coming up. Legislative Update and Policy Committee. I'm going to waive my report until next time. Thanks. Um, no official report, but just a reminder that the Policy Committee will meet next on Wednesday, May 1st. Uh, at 5.30. Thank you. 5B, advanced learning updates. Good evening. Um, Kelly will be setting up to share out the presentation. Um, there we go. Thank you, Kelly. So this evening, um, we wanted to share with the board an update that we have with advanced learning. And when I think about the strategic plan, and there's a couple slides in there that align uh, this presentation to the strategic plan, um, because I had the honor of being there when we put that uh, together and we're in this frame of mind about, um, you know, uh, Board President Levy, um, we, th we thought about what do we really want for our schools and what do we want for our kids? And this advanced learning presentation, I think in a way captures uh, the spirit of some of those conversations. And um, I have uh, Director Kelly Gorud here, Dr. Gorud, and um, Christy Champion, who is one of our three uh, advanced learning specialists in uh, the district. Specifically, when we think about advanced learning, um, we want to think about equity, and this presentation will surface some of those conversations, um, how we are addressing disproportionality of representation, how we are challenging systems and structures that we have in place that can either perpetuate inequity or create a more equitable um, system in place. And um, of course, academic achievement and how that aligns to the whole child and opening access to um, enrichment and advanced learning opportunities. And also thinking about student engagement and how we're engaging our students um, in meaningful ways. And so Kelly and Christy are going to lean into this. Um, but this is a bigger context also. So um, keep that in mind that the school district of Beloit is not working in isolation with this work. This is a, this is a statewide conversation and it has been for quite some time. Um, and so you'll see some of the work that we have done with our partnerships um, and some grant opportunity that we had um, in reflecting on where we were uh, three years ago and where we are now um, and some of the changes that we're seeing specifically in addressing disproportionality um, in, in students that had access to what used to be called gifted and talented, moving to state language advanced learning and now who's participating in that as we continue to improve systems and structures and make them more equitable for kids. Perfect. 
Thank you, Teresa. Good evening. I'm Christy Champion, one of the three advanced learner specialists in the district. The other two members of the team include Josh Thorson and Felicia Whitfield. Together as a team, we work together to implement the advanced learning programming here in the school district of Beloit. Josh and Felicia's primary focus, elementary, and mine, the middle and the high school. So as Teresa already mentioned, um, we really did lean in on the strategic plan. And so what we're gonna share with you tonight is just an update from a grant that we talked about several years ago um, when we were offered the opportunity to join. Um, we've been working through this grant for about two and a half years now with some support. Um, and we'd like to share some of the, the kind of early outcomes that we have had um, by doing this grant work. So the grant that we were a part of is actually a really large grant that was offered by the Department of Education um, and act awarded to um, East Tennessee State University. Um, East Tennessee State University partnered with other large institutions, including uh, state departments of public instruction, um, other universities in the area, and one of those universities was UW-Whitewater. And so we came to be a part of this grant through some connections at UW-Whitewater. And what the grant's focus was, was on creating effective and equitable advanced learning identification systems. So we're really thinking about how do we choose the students that are gonna be a part of the advanced learning programming and get those services. And one of the very large goals of this grant was to try to do some work to mitigate the historic underrepresentation of students of color and low income students. And so we were invited into this grant with nine other districts from across three states. There was only 10 districts that were selected to do this work. Um, and we've been working with this team for about three years. The grant did not provide us with financial support. They did not give us money. Um, instead, what they did is they allowed um, us to work with some of their consultants. So we, we were able to work with a data analysis consultant who looked at some of our school data um, about advanced learning, who was being selected and who's being left out of the system. And then we got some consultation support from this team as well to kind of talk through that data analysis and, and um, processes and practices that we might change and some decisions that we might need to make. And then they also provided professional learning for our team as well. I'm just gonna leave that there. Right. The state of Wisconsin requires we identify and provide programming in the five areas listed, specific academic, general intellectual, creativity, leadership, and visual performing arts. The grant specifically investigated specific academics, general intellectual, and creativity because those are the areas in which we use standardized tests to identify students. In leadership and VPA, visual performing arts, we use other me measures, including portfolios. So what the grant um, team asked us to do was to evaluate our advanced learning system through what they call a CASA model. And this is a research framework for really thinking about um, all aspects of your advanced learning program. Um, CASA stands for Cost, Alignment, Sensitivity, and Access. And so um, as we kind of worked through the grant, they had us think about do our practices for assessment um, meet some cost effective mis uh, effectiveness benchmarks? Are we paying too much for the system that we're trying to get? Um, alignment really kind of asked us to think about um, do the assessments that we provide actually align with the identifications we're trying to make? It's surprising how often in school districts uh, we use assessment scores that don't actually align to the services we're getting ready to provide to students. Um, sensitivity deals with do we have the right mix of students? Does the mix of students in our advanced learner program mirror represent what our district is as a whole? Um, or are we over selecting certain populations of students? And then access deals with, um, are we really like providing the right levels of service and have we accidentally or unintentionally thrown up barriers for students being able to, to get access into the system? 
Um, so through our initial analysis, we did find that we were um, using an assessment. It was a secondary assessment, so it wasn't our primary one. Um, but it cost about $14,000 a year, and it was not actually selecting additional students for us. So uh, we were able to go ahead and eliminate that. Um, our alignment was actually really good. So we had high alignment, and they did not recommend any changes to our programming there. Um, but our sensitivity uh, measures, though we, we had diverse students in our advanced learner program, our sensitivity was not high. We, didn't, we were not mirroring our district. And so this was an area that they really pushed us to think about and think about some of our practices that we could change. Um, and then in terms of accessibility, we were fortunate in the fact that we don't rely on referrals um, into our advanced learner system, which is one of the big barriers for access. But in our case, because our sensitivity was low, we also had some access to our programming that was, that was also low. And so they really thought, they pressed us to think about practices that we could change in that regard as well. So a big part of working through this grant was really doing some deep data analysis. So we actually went through several rounds of analysis um, with the team. They looked at two years of data with us uh, with second and fifth graders. And what you see modeled here is second grade data. I'm not actually going to dig in on the chart specifically. Um, but one of the things they found um, was that our original practices, the practices that we went into this grant with, um, were not very sensitive because we were using national norms. And in a school district where our test scores are already on the lower side um, and pretty variable across buildings, using national norms was locking some students out of the system. Um, so they, they did some forecast modeling for us. And what they did is, is, is we, we chatted with them about lots of different options. They actually forecasted about eight different models for us. You see four of them here. And the four that you see represented here are the ones that we really dug deeply into. And those are using what they call proximal norms. So those are norms that are closer to home for us. Um, and so we looked at what, what would change, who would the students be in our system if we benchmarked off district norms. So we looked at the top 5 or 10% of students in the district, or if we benchmarked off building level norms. So we look at the top 5 or 10% of students in each building. And one of our major concerns when we did our data analysis is that we were not consistently identifying students in all of our buildings. So we had pretty wide variability in the percentage of students that we were identifying across the district. Some buildings had more. Some buildings had a lot less. And so we really wanted to do some work to try to normalize that because we believe that there are advanced learning students, advanced students in all of our buildings. Um, so after we met with the team and we did this data analysis, our advanced learning team here in the district sat down and we actually did a, a tabletop exercise. So we selected a couple of these models and we went through all of last year's student data and we literally, with post-its, um, determined who was going to receive services and in what areas. And so we, we went through and we modeled this for ourselves. And coming out of that exercise, we chose to try as a pilot this year um, using building level norms at the 95th percentile. So what we're doing is selecting the top 5% of students at each building. So every building is represented in this data set. The students have been receiving their advanced learning programming and the services this year. And so then we took a look at what was our mix of students before we started this grant, and what does that look like now that we've changed our practice? And that's what you can see represented here in this table. Um, we did add a, an additional about 20 students to our advanced learning program, and that was one of the things that we were paying attention to, because we cannot double the size of our program. We only have three specialists. But 20 was a manageable number for our team, and when we did the demographic breakdown, you can see that there was actually quite a big shift in some of the student populations, particularly with our ELL students and students with disabilities. And while it's not perfect, this is a lot closer to mirroring the demographics in our district than what we were doing before. Um, one of the things I just want to make sure that I address is that someone might ask, did we really lower our standards, right? By changing our practices, are we lowering our standards? This is a question that comes out in the research. And I would argue that the answer to that is no. Our advanced learner team is still providing the same services at the tier three level that they were providing two and three years ago. Our students are still competing in Math 24, 
BookQuest, MathMeet, all of the things that they've been doing. And they've been performing quite well this year. Um, so no, we did not lower our standards, but what we did is we invited more students in to participate, and we are having to rethink how we support students when they enter the program. And so the other piece of the work that we're doing is really thinking about how do we move to a continuum of support so that we are not just using a two-tiered system for advanced learning. In other words, you're in or you're out. So what we're doing is we're building a system that mirrors our intervention system. In our intervention system, there's classroom levels of support at tier two. We are in the process of writing curricular resources that will allow classroom levels of extension as well for tier two advanced learners. And this should help push all of our students to grow so that we can meet them at their level and continue them along their path instead of allowing them to be an advanced learner and maybe not grow as much as they should be. As you can see, through the work of the grant, we have been addressing possible inequities in our system, trying to support our advanced students with our growth and achievement, and creating a system where students from all schools can be engaged and belong. And to end, going forward, we will continue to monitor the district's data. We will work with the TLE team to build out the resources for our tier two students and provide the programming we know our families know and love. Just to name a few, creativity workshops, Math Meet, Math 24, Destination Imagination, BIF, and the list goes on. Please go ahead and check out our website to find out more information about how we identify in the School District of Beloit and all of the amazing programs we have going on here in the School District of Beloit. And I do just want to take just a second to thank Kelly for her knowledge and support of our Advanced Learner Department and Teresa. Okay, let me jump in real quick. Uh, if you don't mind, first of all, let me thank the the team for the work that's went into this report. We had um, to really sit down and think about you know how we wanted to share this information. And I think sometimes um, this is one of those things that you know people may have a lot of different opinions about, um, but when it comes down to you know um, the gifted and talented program in general, we know that there's a lot of conversations where you know kids have been left out of this conversation. I, I think we can all agree, maybe, um, in the community that there is a need to improve our gifted and talented opportunities in our school district. And I say that because we know that there's other, other most school districts look at one, one or two areas, academics, and sometimes I like to say music, sometimes. Actually, just academics, um, to, be, to be honest with you. Um, but there's other levels of, of advanced learning that we oftentimes don't touch on. Leadership is an advanced learning opportunity. Creativity is an advanced learning opportunity. Arts, music is an advanced learning opportunity. Um, and so that to, 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 to expand in these opportunities in the gifted and talented program, or programming is just as important to a school district to grow. And so again, I want to thank the team for you know taking the time to put this this information together. Um, I know it's never easy um, to do uh, do this type of work, um, but it's what it's the work that we need to do for our, all of our students in our school district. And so, um, I believe that the gifted and talented, or just the advanced learning opportunities, period, are for all kids. I do believe that. Um, how we get them to that space is the work of a school district, and it will take time. To, to make sure that we have opportunities for all of our students to feel um, that they are a part of our advanced learning um, um, opportunities. And so I guess I wanted to share that. And again, thank the team for um, putting this information together. Again, can't do it without you all. So again, thank you. And the teachers, of course. And the students. Any uh, questions from board members? I don't have a question, um, but just thank you for, for show, put, putting the presentation together and showing us what a beautiful marriage, rigor, and inclusion can be. Um, thank you for challenging our students and rethinking how you support them. 
I think that was just said so lovely. Um, and as a parent and as a board member, thank you for the opportunities you've provided for our students to shine on a local level and a statewide level. Um, just to see them come home with those medals and then excited to wear them to school the next day. And mm -hmm. like that, it's, it's that's a big deal. And that is building confidence. And like Dr. Garrison said, um, those leadership skills. So, so thank you for everything that you do. It has wonderful ripple effects. Anybody else uh, comment a question? Can you go back to the slide that shows the difference from 21? The demographics. To right, the demographic slide. As long as my computer behaves, I sure can. Yes. All right. Now, I'm just, I just wanted to highlight that space because, like it says, implementing new practices and thinking about the work in our strategic plan where we're talking about equity and using that disproportionality in data. Yeah. Um, you do have to look at the demographics of our district and understand who we are serving. And so when we see 2021 and the difference in the number of students that are being served in 23, 24, that's because of the practices. And so when we're trying to, we have to win with all the children that we have here in Beloit. Mm -hmm. And to do that, as you've shown, there's a change of practice that has garnered a better result for all of our children. Uh, so I do want to highlight uh, and thank you for that work uh, as you not only work that in this advanced learner space, but also for all the students and the other spaces that as you're using these data practices and you've got structures and systems, mm -hmm. that that work goes across all. Thank you. that we're done with the presentation then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, discussion items, action items, I have listed in 5A. What, what happened? Oh, excuse me. I just want to confirm if we, have, if we have a shelter in place right now, because you guys probably want to leave. Um, I just want to make sure that's safe to do. Oh, we can just, just still, just still. I promise I'm right across the street. <laughs> I'm not going to check the Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, to make our way through uh, C, um, and this conversation doesn't have to be long, but in the naming of schools, facilities, and properties, um, that's our policy. And then rule one, our procedures for naming schools or parts of schools. Uh, we do have some um, a request uh, from Mr. Simmons and the Watts family. Uh, that needs to be addressed. There's some appointments and things that will need to be done. And we also have um, ceremonies to conduct um, for some that happen. And I will um, work with Dr. Garrison to line those things up so uh, that work is in order. We're on to six, our consent agenda. Typically, there's no separate discussion of items unless a board member so requests, in which event the items will be removed from the general order of business and considered in their normal sequence on the agenda. Um, does anyone have a need to remove anything from the agenda? Okay, is there any action uh, that we'd like to take on our consent agenda? I move approval of our consent agenda. Second. It's been moved by board member Amy Levy, seconded by board member Megan Miller. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes unanimously. And we're down to future meeting dates. Uh, swearing in and board organizational meeting Monday, April 22nd at 6 p.m. Policy committee meeting Wednesday, May 1st at 5.30 p.m. Business operations and finance committee Tuesday, May 7th at 5.30 p.m. Human Resource, uh, Tuesday, May 7th at 6.30 p.m. Regular board meeting, May 7th at 7 p.m. All right. A motion may be made and a vote uh, taken to convene the Board of Education in a closed session pursuant to section 19.85, parentheses one, parentheses C, uh, and section 19.85, parentheses one, parentheses G, the Wisconsin State Statutes relative to considering an individual employee's job performance 
and employees and employment status the superintendent's evaluation and contract is there a motion so moved oh sorry no second all right this has been moved by board member megan miller seconded by uh amy levy mrs dooley can you provide us a roll call vote please Mr. Schneider, can yes, you? Yes, oh. um, power had momentarily went out. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Yes, can. So, all right. Roll call vote okay. for closed session. Tia Johnson. Aye. Amy Levy. Aye. Megan Miller. Aye. Brian Nichols. Here, or right. aye. It's, it's that type of <laughs> night. You're right. Brian Anderson. Aye. Greg Snyder. Aye. And Sean Levy. Aye. Uh, so the we are you know, five, unanimously, we are going into uh, closed session. Uh, the Board of Education may reconvene uh, to public session in order to take any action, if necessary, on items discussed in closed session. And if we don't come back and open. That means we closed and we adjourned from closed session. So if we need to, we will come back. Okay.